Was it for money? Was it for love? Or was it suicide? Hello, true crimeers. This is the mystery of the eight-day bride. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Christina Kettlewell was 22 years old. She was originally from Ontario in Canada. Sometime around 1944, Christina would meet this man here, Jack Kettlewell, who was a war veteran. Christina's family was not so fond of him. They didn't like the idea that he wasn't Catholic. And when they wanted to get married, her family just simply didn't approve. So on May 12, 1947, the two of them eloped. Now, they had a very unusual honeymoon because they brought someone along. Jack's very good buddy, Ronald Berry. According to a lot of people, the trio would spend an unusual amount of time together, just all together. But it was kind of just extra strange that he went along with them on their honeymoon. As a matter of fact, they would use his cabin, which was in Severn Falls, Ontario. On the evening of May 20th, 1947, a body was found floating in the Severn River. The woman's body was in just nine inches of water, about 150 feet away from where this cabin used to be. This is the aftermath of a cabin that had completely burnt to the ground. Well, what was this cabin? It was the cabin where the trio was honeymooning. Ronald Berry says that at one point he left the cabin and it was just Jack and Christina. When he got back to the cabin later on, there was smoke billowing from it. So he ran inside and he found his friend Jack. He was unconscious and he had an injury to his head. Now, in one story, he also reports seeing Christina there. But in other stories I read, it's, he, it's said that Christina wasn't seen there when he got back. But he pulled his friend out of the, the cabin and then it burnt completely to the ground within an hour. And then they reported Christina as missing. Then Christina was found floating face down in the Severn River and she was deceased. The autopsy would show that she had levels of codeine in her system, but her cause of death was drowning. Christina's family was just very, they were confused about a lot of things. Why was Ronald Berry with them on their honeymoon? Her family always suspected that because Ronald Berry was always with them, that he had some kind of crush or wanted to be in a relationship with Christina. But in an interesting turn of events, there would be one point where Jack would admit that he and Ronald were having an affair. But then later on after that, they would state that they were coerced into saying that. But then there was evidence to suggest that maybe they were telling the truth about that part, that they were actually in a relationship. Jack had taken out two different life insurance policies on Christina. Who were they payable to? Ronald. They were, I, th I believe, each for $5,000, which obviously back then is a lot of money. But the more interesting part is that it would double if Christina died in an accident. They also discovered that Ronald took out an insurance policy on his cabin. Who was that policy paid out to? Jack. They found out that Christina, nor any members of Jack's family, were a part of his will. Everything, should he ever, like, die, would go to Ronald. Weird. The two of them were never arrested or charged with anything. However, there was an inquest to determine whether or not Christina died truly an accidental death or a suicide, or was it foul play? And during those inquests, Ronald and Jack were, they were celebrities to all the local ladies. This is them literally smiling and signing autographs for women outside of the courthouse. Seemed to be all fun for them. The inquest did show that Christina had written not one, not two, but at least three different suicide notes. They confirmed that it was in her handwriting. But the weird thing is, is they were allegedly in the cabin when it burned down. But for some, somehow, they were still perfectly intact and not damaged at all. Because apparently Ronald or Jack, one of them, had spared them. Moreover, how does a woman who knows how to swim... How does she drown herself intentionally in nine inches of water? I'm not saying it's impossible, it just seems very strange. Could the codeine in her system had attributed to maybe her, I don't know, passing out deliberately in the... I, it doesn't make sense. Another thing that doesn't make sense is that when there were volunteers going back and forth to the river to get buckets of water to put out the fire in the cabin, not one single person noticed the body in the river. It was wouldn't be until much later that evening when her body was found, just 150 feet away. It's all very strange. The inquest led to 
No charges, no indictments, no arrests. And ultimately, her death was pretty much just determined to be a suicide. Jack, pictured here in 1976, would later remarry. And whether or not he and Ronald truly had some kind of romantic relationship, well, like I said, in court, they said, one of them said that it was true, and then later would say they were coerced into saying that, which obviously that kind of thing happens. It's just all around a very bizarre mystery. The elements of a, you know, planned murder are there, but the physical evidence is not there. And with this happening back in 1947, there is nobody left to even charge. And so the death of Christina Kettlewell, aka the Eight Day Bride, may forever remain a mystery. First, he had a small role in the movie The Exorcist. Then, he became a killer. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Addison Verrill. Viewer discretion is advised. Addison Verrill was born on August 11th, 1941, and he was born in Connecticut. By the time this case occurs, he's 36 years old and he's living in New York, and he is actually a reporter for Variety. And this is in Manhattan. Addison was also a gay man at a time when, you know, being out was not exactly the safest thing to do. But at the same time, the gay community was still very, you know, strong. But typically when crimes at that time were committed against gay people, it was like nobody seemed to care. And what's unfortunate about this case is I think because of that, there really isn't a whole lot of information out there about Addison or who he was as a person. He was really kind of just reduced down to a victim. Pictured here is a man named Paul Bateson. If you have seen the original Exorcist movie, this is a scene from that movie depicting an angiogram. And the hospital staff that's actually featured in the movie are actual hospital people. These are the actual trained, you know, professionals who do this thing normally. And this is Bateson pictured with the lead actress of the film, Linda Blair. Well, a few years after the film was released, he was fired from his hospital job. He became an alcoholic, and that affected him keeping work. Paul would then get jobs working as like a cashier at a porn theater. He did work cleaning apartments. Paul would also label himself as not exclusively gay, but he was into men, and he frequented gay bars. It was one of these gay bars where he met Addison Verrill. That was on September 14th, 1977. Paul and Addison would go back to Addison's apartment here in this building. He owned a studio apartment there. And I believe it was the next day, Addison was found brutally murdered inside his apartment. He had been beaten and stabbed to death. His head had been crushed with a skillet and he had a knife piercing his heart. Then a writer here at the Village Voice would write an article on this case. It was uh, written by a man named Arthur Bell. Well, after the story was published, Arthur Bell gets a personal phone call from someone stating that how he liked Arthur Bell's writing, he liked his article, but Arthur Bell described the murder of Addison Verrill as being done by a psychopath. Well, the person that called him said, well, I was the one who killed him, but I'm not a psychopath. But the caller then goes on to say, that, hey, I, I met Addison at the Badlands bar. Then the two of them had gone to a BDSM club, then eventually back to his apartment. And he gave details about the murder that nobody else really should have known about. So Arthur Bell goes to police with this information. And around that same time, someone else calls police and says, hey, I know who killed Addison Verrill because the person who did it confessed to me. He said that person was Paul Bateson. This individual would recount to police the confession he gave him, and it pretty much lined up exactly with the confession that Arthur Bell got. So Paul Bateson was arrested and charged with the murder. He would later try to say that he was uh, drunk when he made that confession, and that it couldn't be taken seriously. But you had two different people giving the exact same story, and so it was true. He killed Addison Verrill. One of the issues surrounding cases like this is that People didn't really want to investigate the murders of gay people. People just couldn't be bothered to care about them. And if this reporter hadn't gotten this confession, who knows if this ever would have been solved. If that friend hadn't come forward to state, you know, this, is, this person confessed to it, would this case have ever been solved? Because again, this was during a time when gay men or there's hate crimes committed against gay men. There's murders committed against them. And more often than not, they weren't investigated and they were never solved. Thankfully, this one did. 
Now, Paul Bateson, whose character would be featured on the second season of the show Mindhunter on Netflix, he would end up getting convicted of the murder and sentenced to somewhere around 20 years in prison. The director of The Exorcist, William Friedkin, would actually visit him in jail. And Paul Bateson said he was a serial killer and he confessed to like five or six more murders. Said he dismembered men and put them in trash bags. And these were men that no one cared about because, you know, they're gay men. There was some attempt to correlate these killings to some an unsolved string of murders called the Bag Murders. However, they were never able to link Paul Bateson to any of those murders or any other one. There has never been any physical evidence to suggest he killed anyone else other than Addison Verrill. He was released in 2003 when he looked like this, but really after that, no one really knows exactly what happened to him. He kind of just fell out of the limelight, thankfully. He may be a serial killer, or he may not be, but it turns out the movie The Exorcist had more than one demon. There is potentially some very breaking news on the Aisha Degree case. If you do not know her case, if you click on the comment, you can see my video on it, or just search her, and there's a bunch of videos from other creators as well. But today, September 12th, 2024, some information has come out about a search of a property. So Aisha Degree was a nine-year-old girl who vanished from Shelby, North Carolina on February 14th, 2000. And one of the bigger aspects of the case was that Aisha Degree, according to a few witnesses, was seen standing next to a green colored car, possibly seen getting into that car. The description of what type of vehicle it was did seem to be a, kind of like varied from person to person. But, and this is a reporter who's been reporting on this case today here in Shelby on Sherryville Road in this property just behind him. The police and the FBI have been searching this property very extensively, it looks like, for the past couple of days. They've had several uh, people combing through every square inch. They have been using uh, scent dogs and cadaver dogs, ground penetrating radar. And then this vehicle was pulled from that property just today. And as you can see, it is a green colored vehicle. Now, there is very little specific information that's been released to the public, but the news helicopters were able to see some things. And there was at one point on this property, they put up, the FBI did put up this tent and they were searching in that area. However, who this house actually belongs to, who the property belongs to, it has not been given to the public yet. How they got to this location, what tips and that kind of thing, again, not released yet. At least as of me filming this now on September 12th at about 12.40 p.m. Arizona time. But by all accounts, this search was extremely large and it appeared to be very thorough. And the fact that they pulled a green colored vehicle from that property, I don't know if it was buried or if it was just parked somewhere on the property, I'm not sure. I mean, the car does look pretty worn and covered in dirt, so maybe it was buried. But hopefully they'll release some more specific details soon. But they do also have to be, you know, careful with it because they can't just lay all their cards on the table, especially if a suspect is still alive out there. But that is the update. Uh, it does appear that this is a pretty significant breakthrough in her case. And so hopefully very soon that maybe they can recover her and give her back to her family. But once I hear more about it, I will post a video about it. In a breaking news update on the Asia Degree case, authorities in North Carolina have stated that they do believe that she was in fact the victim of a homicide. Hello, true crimeers. This is an update on the Asia Degree case. Viewer discretion is advised. So as many of you know, Aisha Degree was a nine-year-old girl who disappeared on Valentine's Day in 2000, and this was in North Carolina. Back in 2016, police announced some new witness statements that they saw potentially Aisha Degree getting into a green-colored vehicle way back in 2000. The big update the other day was that the police had executed search warrants of properties there, and on one of those properties, they did find a green-colored car but the names of the owners of the properties weren't released at that time, but they are now. So if you can recall, I think it was about a year or so after Aisha's disappearance, they found Aisha's backpack. It was wrapped in some kind of plastic bag. And in the backpack was a New Kids on the Block t-shirt and McElligot's pool from Dr. Seuss, the book. They have now announced that there was DNA evidence found on both items. There was a strand of hair found on the t-shirt and some other kind of uh, DNA on the book. The DNA from this and the shirt did not match. Those was two different people, but both did not belong to Asia. So according to court documents, the search warrants were linked to a man named Roy Lee Dedman and his wife, Connie Dedman. And the properties that they had been searching over the past 
probably week or so at this point, they were all connected to the Deadman family. The strand of hair that was found on the shirt, police have now announced, belonged to one of the daughters of Roy and Connie Deadman. Her name is Anna Lee Victoria Deadman Ramirez. Now, she was only 13 years old at the time Aisha disappeared. The other DNA evidence came back to match a man named Russell Bradley Underhill, who has since passed away. I think he died in 2004. So from what I understand, and it's kind of a little unclear at this point, but the Deadmans, Connie and Roy, they ran some kind of uh, assisted living places, some kind of like medical facilities. And one of the patients connected to them directly was a man named Russell Underhill. And Russell, I guess, uh, from time to time would be seen driving this car. So I don't know 100% um, how the 13-year-old daughter is connected directly to the murder. But the police in North Carolina have also stated that they believe that Connie and Roy, given their daughter's ages at the time, that they would have had to have been involved in at least covering up the crime. I don't know if they think that Russell Underhill was the person who actually killed her, or if they're saying the 13-year-old daughter did. It's a little hazy at the time of me filming this on September 17th at 8 o'clock in the morning, 2024. Aisha's body has not been recovered. I do know that there was several things, pieces of evidence collected from all of these properties, five properties in total. I guess there was a tooth found that they have collected as evidence, but I don't know if that's considered Aisha's tooth or what. It should be noted that the Deadmans have said they had nothing to do with whatever happened to Aisha. But it does sound like they are right there on the verge of finally solving this case. But they need to find Aisha so they can give her back to her family and lay her to rest. And they do still need any information from any potential witnesses to come forward. So if you have information, please call 704-672-6100. At 3.57 a.m. on February 10th, 1999, the body of a teenage girl was found along this road in Maine. Would her murder ever get solved? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Ashley Willette. Your viewer discretion is advised. This is another long video. This will be a little under 10 minutes long, so this will be the only video of today. Ashley Willette was born on March 29th, 1983. That's two years before me. Exact day. Growing up, she was a very happy-go-lucky kid. She was well-behaved. She got good grades in school. Ashley had a lot of friends. She was an awesome sister. She was a great daughter. And she absolutely loved spending time with her friends. When she turned about 12 or 13 years old or so, she did have a bit of a rebellious streak, as do most teenagers. But by the time she was 15, according to her parents, everything was beginning to turn back around. And everything just seemed to be going really well for her until the night of February 10th, 1999. At that time, Ashley was 15 years old. She was a sophomore at Thornton Academy in Saco, Maine. February 10th was a school night, but her parents did allow her to spend the night at her friend Aaliyah's house. The two girls were gonna wake up early and get to school. But something that Ashley withheld from her parents was that this was not just a regular old sleepover. Her friend's parents were out of town, and so Aaliyah was having a little bit of a party at her house. At 10 p.m. that night, Ashley would call her parents from Aaliyah's home, and that would be the last time that her mom ever spoke to Ashley. At 3.57 a.m., a man was driving down this road here, which was in Scarborough, Maine, and he found a young girl lying in the road. She was motionless, she wasn't responding, she did not appear to be breathing, and so he alerted the authorities. When uh, police and ambulance arrive, it was already too late. This young girl was pronounced dead. And she was found right along this road here. You can see the little uh, tribute there for her. The coroner would soon determine that the body was, in fact, a 15-year-old Ashley Willette. Ashley had been strangled to death, and they said there was some kind of sexual nature to her attack. So what happened, and how did she get there? So that's when the information begins to trickle out, that there was actually a party, that Ashley was there. There were several people there, including some older boys. They found out that at this party was a man or a young man named Daniel Sanborn, and he was there with his friend, Jay Carney. Ashley apparently had a crush on Daniel's brother, Stephen Sanborn, and she asked if she could get a ride to the Sanborn's home to talk to Stephen. Well, another friend named Edwin would end up taking her to that house, and eventually he just dropped her off there. This here is a Sanborn residence. 
So police reach out to the Sanborns and the parents and the two brothers. So they tell police that at about 12.30 a.m., Ashley was knocking on their basement door uh, because the basement is where the, the Sanborn brothers had their bedrooms. According to them, Ashley told them that she had gotten into a fight with her parents and she had nowhere to stay. And so uh, Stephen asked his mom, like, can she just sleep here on the couch? And she said yes. 12.45 a.m. was reportedly the last time that the Sanborn parents saw Ashley. When they woke up in the morning, Ashley was gone. They just assumed she left in the middle of the night. Daniel said that the last time he saw Ashley, because he had gotten home at that point from the party, was when he actually got Ashley an orange soda from their fridge and gave it to her. But then she complained that it was too warm in the basement and that she was going to go upstairs and sleep on the couch where it's cooler. And that's the last time Daniel says he saw her. Stephen claims he barely interacted with her that night and that he just assumed that Ashley slept in Dan's room. Both boys were eventually brought in for a more extensive questioning. And when they did that, they were given permission to search the Sanborn house. And they also searched uh, Dan's vehicle. In, the, in his vehicle, they found uh, dirt and vegetation that matched the exact same dirt and vegetation that was found in Ashley's hair when her body was found. In the Sanborn home, they did say that at one point they found small blood droplets, but when they tested them, it was actually not even human blood. They took other things from the home for evidence. They did, uh, they checked underneath the boy's fingernails. And so they have lots of physical evidence. They just haven't been able to link anything they found in the house or the car directly to Ashley's actual murder. The dirt and the vegetation, it's... Some, it could be telling, but at the same time, it's like, it's a common stuff you see all over the area. Detectives would at some point say that they have conducted like 200 plus interviews. They spoke to people at that party. And they also said that they cannot prove at all that Ashley was alive when she left the Sanborn residence. And it does sound, I was reading some uh, message boards and stuff and people who were local to this, who went to school with her, were kind of chiming in that it sounds like the community believes that one of, if not both of, the Sanborn brothers were involved in her murder. However, there is never, there's never been any physical evidence to actually link them directly to it. It was their home that she was last confirmed to be in. And that was at about 1245 or so in the morning. And then at 3.57 a.m., she's found in the middle of the road, dead. I mean, one plus one is two, you know? And then there's an extra twist to this case. Pictured here was a young man named Angel Tony Torres. On May 21st, 1999, Tony attended a party there in that area of Maine, and he attended that party with a man named Jay Carney. Jay Carney was also the same person who was at the party that Ashley had attended. And he was there at that party with one of the Sanborn brothers, Dan. Well, on May 21st, 1999, at that party he was attending, he was last seen at 2 o'clock in the morning, and then he has never been seen since. He had apparently left that party with that Jay Carney person. Jay Carney came back to the party looking kind of disheveled and dirty. But Tony was not with him, and again, never seen again. Well, the interesting twist here is that Tony was also at that party that Ashley attended back in March, the night she was murdered. Well, at one point, according to Tony's parents, the he and his parents were watching a news story and Ashley, her murder came up. And he kind of perked up and said to his parents, I know who killed her. I know who did it. His parents tried to urge him to go directly to police right then and there, but he chose not to. He was kind of holding off on it. And then he goes missing after going to a party with Jay Carney, who has that direct connection to the Sanborn brothers. Tony has never been found. He would eventually be declared legally dead, but there has been no updates in his case. And it sounds like, again, the rumors around town is that he was killed because of what he knew. He was killed to be silenced. And his parents have expressed regret for basically not grabbing him and saying, we're going to police right now. Ashley Willette's parents would eventually file a wrongful death lawsuit against the Sanborns, but that was eventually dismissed altogether. Two years after Ashley was murdered, her father died suddenly of a heart attack, never knowing the answers, never getting justice for his daughter. 
Some say it was the stress and his fight for his daughter's justice that eventually just took over and literally broke his heart. In a more recent update, some point in 2019 or 2020 or so, uh, the police there in Maine have said they believe they know what happened to Ashley, but they could not make an arrest because they did not have any physical evidence to prove their case, to take to court and get an indictment and to secure a conviction beyond a reasonable doubt. The two brothers never turned on each other, even though it is believed uh, without the physical evidence that they were, or if not one of them, was responsible for the murder of Ashley Willette. I think they are hoping that with now today's modern technology, they can take some more swabs, see if they can get some DNA, anything that could help connect anyone to her murder. I don't know if this is confirmed, but according to someone local to the area, one of the people potentially responsible has died of a drug overdose. But I cannot confirm that. So it sounds like they know exactly who did this. They just cannot prove it. But hopefully someone can come forward with some damning evidence to help get closure for this family, to get the answers they deserve. And with that, they may get answers for what happened to Tony. And perhaps they can find him and bring him home and lay him to rest. Somebody somewhere out there knows the truth and perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information about the murder of Ashley Willette and the disappearance of Tony Torres, please call 207-624-7076. For 30 years, she was only known as Tent Girl until an early internet sleuth discovered who she was. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Barbara Ann Hackman. If your discretion is advised. Pictured here is a man named Wilbur Riddle. Decades before this picture was taken, he was walking along U.S. Route 25 near Georgetown, Kentucky. He was scavenging for some kind of parts, glass insulator parts, I guess, when he stumbled across a large tent-type material just lying in the woods off the road. The material was like a large canvas, which was known back then, this type of material, to use to wrap up tents. When they opened this material, they found a decomposing human body of a female. This was on May 17th, 1968. And it was more than obvious that this was a case of a homicide. There was no identification on her. And this being 1968, you couldn't just like put fingerprints into a database and automatically find a person. DNA wasn't a thing back then. So really all they could do was put out composite drawings of the victim. And so this is that composite drawing. And they would only refer to her as Tent Girl. In 1971, she was laid to rest by the city and she was given a grave marker that just said Tent Girl. And this was another composite drawing they did of her but no one ever came forward to say they recognized the image. Initially, the coroner actually stated that this was the body of a young girl, aged between 16 and 19. Well, later they would find out that was incorrect. And it would take 30 years and the very early internet to finally find out who she was. So earlier I showed this photo of this is the man who found the body. Standing next to him is his son-in-law. His son-in-law is named Todd Matthews. Todd was married to Wilbur's daughter. Well, Todd said that Wilbur, this whole thing was that just constantly aided him. You know, he found this body and they didn't know who she was. And it kind of, it, it really tormented him, Wilbur. And so Todd wanted to see if he could do anything to kind of help ease that and also help find out who this girl was. And then when the internet became a, a common thing in households sometime in the you know 90s, Todd would use the internet to put out the information of Tent Girl. And he worked tirelessly trying to reach people, trying to find out anything he could with very limited information. This is early internet, well before you can pop a name into Google and you get 16,000 different you know options. But he posted this photo and then Todd also searched tirelessly through public records, public databases, he would scour like different websites that were talking about missing persons. And then he created his own website called Tent Girl. He put a lot of work into this. And finally, in 1998, after all of his work, he found a description of a missing woman from 1967. And this was posted on a missing persons website. And this was of a young woman who had just been married and she had an eight month old baby. And she disappeared in 1967 from Lexington, Kentucky, which was really close by where the body was found. 
So Todd contacts one of the family members who was involved in this missing persons case. He got a description of her and it matched the description of Tent Girl. The only difference is that this particular missing person was about 24 years old. So a little older than what the coroner initially determined. So the police in Kentucky got involved. They reached out to the family of this missing person, got the description and confirmed that it was a very damn near match to what the, who the body was. The missing person was Barbara Ann Hackman Taylor. She vanished in late 1967 from her home, but she shared with her husband and her eight-month-old baby. Now, they would find out that the husband never reported her missing. The husband would tell family that she ran off with another man, which they can confirm is not true because she was found dead, I mean, literally just right after she went missing. But eventually, her own family members would report her missing. Now, obviously, with this being in the late 60s, this is before there was easy widespread communication, no email, cell phones, text messaging. And so even though the body was only found 15 miles away from where she was living, there just wasn't that connection made for whatever reason. I, I, I can't say for certain why. But to confirm, they wanted to exhume Tent Girl's body. They did so in 1998. They were able to extract DNA from her remains. They took DNA from Barbara Hackman's family and confirmed that it was the body of Barbara Ann Hackman. And this is Todd pictured with her grave, which they have now uh, given her her proper name. They've taken Taylor off of the name. And this is because police with 100% certainty believe that the her killer was her husband. His name was George Earl Taylor. However, if he was her killer, he would never face justice because in October of 1987, George Taylor died of cancer. Barbara's daughter, who at that point is now a full grown adult, she, they found her in Ohio. She had been living with family her whole life. She was now, you know, married. She had her own kids. She never knew her mom. She was eight months old when she was killed. But, you know, at least she got some answers as to what actually happened to her mother. It's just sad that Barbara Hackman will not get the justice she rightfully deserves. But there is so much to say about this guy here, Todd Matthews. He's not a detective. He's not any kind of investigator. He was just your early, early prototype of an armchair detective, internet sleuth the very beginning stages of the internet, he still managed to get all that work done and identify her. And honestly, he is kind of the unsung hero of this entire story. Since 1943, one question has haunted England. Who put Bella in the Witch Elm? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the body in the Witch Elm. Viewer discretion is advised. It was April of 1943 in the Hagley Woods area of England, which I guess was just outside of Birmingham. In this particular area, which was at that point at least a private property, there were a few young boys who had trespassed onto that property. This was during a time, by the way, when Britain was still in the midst of World War II. Air raids were going on almost every night. And so these young boys had essentially trespassed on this property in order to scavenge for things like birds and eggs to feed their family. And on this property was a large witch elm tree, not this exact one. But one of the boys climbed up into it and he reached inside and he felt what he thought was an egg. It was not an egg. This is the actual witch elm tree, but from it he pulled out a human skull. He and the other boys became so frightened and also concerned that they would get in some serious trouble because they were trespassing, that they'll put the skull back and they ran home promising to never talk about it to anyone. But one of those boys said, I can't keep that in. And so he told his dad, who then goes to the authorities. They then lead the authorities to the witch elm where the skull is once again found. This is the actual skull that was located inside. There was a piece of fabric that was clearly shoved into this person's mouth. There was actually still a patch of skin still attached to the skull with a tuft of hair. There were other skeletal remains found inside the tree. There was women's clothing with the remains and a, I guess, a fake golden wedding ring. This woman had been shoved into the inside of this witch elm tree, which to them immediately screamed murder but they had absolutely no idea who this was. The coroner who worked on these remains uh, figured out that this person was a female and had died roughly 18 months prior to being found. 
she was roughly 35 years old and many years later there would be this recreation done from her skull but something they noticed about her teeth was that she had these two very distinct front teeth they believe that she had been placed into that tree pretty much almost immediately after she was killed because the coroner said that rigor mortis once it sets in it would have been impossible to configure or maneuver the body to get into the position of the tree where it was found. The ripped piece of clothing, which was later determined to be from the clothing that was with her in the tree, that ripped part was shoved down her throat. There is some debate on why that was there. One side suggests that that was partially probably used to kill her. But then there's another story that these four boys who were on the property when they kind of found the skull, they had reached in, they put like a piece of cloth on a stick and put, you know, it into the skull to pull it out. And that part of that clothing item they put on that stick may have just gotten detached in the skull. Because of the wartime conditions and everything that was going on, resources were limited, very depleted. And a proper investigation into this really just could not be done. But they did make efforts, you know, those distinct front teeth they thought would help them find, you know, out her identity pretty quickly, but it didn't. They scoured through hundreds or if not thousands of missing persons reports to see if they can match like the clothing or the distinct front teeth to anyone, but they had no luck. At one point, the bones, uh, the all the bones were given to, I guess, a local university and Decades and decades later, you know, they wanted to do some kind of DNA testing on the bones to see if they could maybe do a familial DNA type, type thing, forensic genealogy. But unfortunately, at some point, the university lost those bones and the skull did not have you know, really anything that they could use to get DNA from, which is why in recent years they've come up with this composite to see if anyone could maybe recall who she was. About six months after the woman was found in the tree. There was an abandoned building outside of Hagley Hall where the body was found. And one day someone came out and noticed scrawled on this wall was the phrase, who put Bella in the witch elm? This is not, this is not that one. This is just a recreation of it. And they're like, okay, is Bella the name of this, of this woman who was found? They thought they had a break, a lead, but they couldn't find anyone named Bella who had been missing. And rumors spread all over the area, like, was this written by her killer? Was this written by an ex-lover? Was this just a, a sick joke, a hoax? And, but it just didn't, it didn't lead to anything. About a decade goes by, and there is someone who was writing articles about this story. And one day, the author of those articles is mailed this letter. This person's claiming to be a woman named Anna. And in this letter, she suggests that the one person who probably knows about who put Bella in the witch elm that person can no longer be prosecuted on this earthly soil, meaning that person was dead. Anna says that the person responsible died as an insane person in 1942, which would have lined up because she was found in early 1943, but was believed to have been placed there 18 months prior. Anna also claims that the victim was Dutch and arrived illegally in England in 1941. Once authorities got this letter, they tried to, you know, reach out to the newspapers and say, hey, we need Anna to come forward, but she never did. So whether or not this letter or this Anna person was telling the truth, or was this another hoax, they, they just didn't know. I guess at one point soon after this, authorities took a statement from a woman named Una or Una, who would claim that she was the Anna who wrote the letter. She said her husband, Jack Mossop, had come home one night completely pale and agitated. And that would have been in April of 1941. He told her that night that he had been at some local, I guess, bar with a Dutch piece, meaning a Dutch woman, and that this woman had passed out in the car on the way home. And her husband was with also another, another friend, a gentleman, and the two of them put the body in the witch elm. Her husband, they confirmed, did die in a mental institution in 1942, soon after all of this would have happened. There was also speculation that this was a ritualistic occult murder. Apparently they found uh, Bella's hand away from the tree, which to them suggested some kind of ritualistic thing. But bones had also been scattered around, which would imply that animals had gotten to her bones at some point. But there was that kind of scary factor of was this done by, you know, was this a witchcraft thing? You know, it's, it's never really been confirmed. 
There was also rumors that the woman may have been a German spy, that she was there doing some kind of cross-country espionage, which eventually leads the authorities to find out about this woman here. Her name was Clara. I guess she was an actress, a performer back then, who was believed to have been some kind of spy. And the rumors were that she had parachuted into that area and somehow got stuck in the Witch Elm. But there was no parachutes or any parachute parts found anywhere near the scene. And there's also the question of how did she die? They never really determined that. I guess a, a recent probing was done into this and they came to the conclusion that this was 99% likely to have been a murder and that the victim was probably 97% not British. They doing research said that Anna's husband Jack Mossop was 33% likely to have committed this crime and only weighed it about 7% likely that this was due to some sort of espionage or spy. They also discovered that Bella may have also been a sex worker and they've tried to circulate this image year after year since it was created, but nothing has ever come from it. Nobody knows the true identity of Bella. This was over 80 years ago. Obviously, whoever put Bella in the Witch Elm is long gone, and they only have the skull, which they have been unsuccessful in being able to obtain any kind of DNA from it. And so Bella in the Witch Elm seems to have just become a scary story. A story that seems to haunt that part of England, even to this day. This was a person. She was put and shoved into that witch elm. She was likely murdered, and her killer got away with it. And what's most sad is that no one knows who she is. She was somebody's family, someone's daughter, someone's, she may have been someone's sister. She may have been someone's mother. And whoever those people are never knew what happened to her. And tragically, the, the question, who put Bella in the Witch Elm, is a mystery that will likely never be solved. She was last seen leaving a courthouse and then never seen again. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Camille Dardanes Dotson. Viewer discretion is advised. Camille Dardanes Dotson was born on February 23rd, 1964, and she grew up in the Chicago, Illinois area. She grew up in what was considered an upper middle class family, well respected, well liked. Now when she was 21, she would actually become known nationally because she had met and fell in love with a man named Gary Dotson. The two of them appeared on some like national news story. Well, the reason why he was kind of infamous was because Gary Dotson was a convicted rapist. Gary was convicted of rape in 1975. Several years into his prison sentence, however, the victim actually recanted her entire story and said she made it all up. So he was released and then he met Camille. They hit it off and they got married. A couple of years later, they would end up having a child together named Ashley. And Camille absolutely loved her daughter. I mean, she was a fantastic mom. But it got to a point where Gary had taken to alcohol a lot and when he did so, he would become abusive. So Camille would eventually leave Gary. And then her and Ashley would move out to Las Vegas, Nevada, where um, Camille's mom was there then living. After some time there, Camille met a man named George Diaz Jr. But unfortunately, not too soon after they started dating, he also became extremely abusive towards her. Camille never really went to college and she also never really had any jobs. And so really the only work she was able to find uh, at first was working at bars. She was a bartender, but that would eventually lead into her becoming a dancer, which then led in her into becoming a sex worker. And she did all of this to take care of her daughter. I mean, she wanted to provide for her daughter. And however she needed to do that is what she was going to do. But this would then eventually lead to her kind of falling into the world of drugs. She in particular became a heavy cocaine user. This would eventually lead to arrests, being like charged with like petty type crimes. And by that time, she's a dancer here at the Crazy Horse in Las Vegas. By September of 1994, several people who were friends with Camille said they hadn't really seen or heard from her in a couple of months, which is why her friends would report her as a missing person. Initially, during that first report, it turns out uh, she was somewhere. She was actually in jail and waiting to be arraigned for some like drug charges. The last confirmed sighting of Camille was her leaving the courthouse on September 3rd, 1994. She was released from custody after passing a drug test. 
And from that date, there has been no sightings of Camille ever again. The crazy thing, though, is that within two weeks of that initial missing persons report being filed, it was completely deleted and erased from the system. And so nobody was looking for her, nobody in, like, officially. And there was just no active police work on her case. It wouldn't be until 2003 when someone, a friend of hers, called the police there in Vegas and said, hey, where are you on the missing persons report? And they said, well, we don't have one. And so they had to file a new one in 2003. They did discover that she did also have a misdemeanor warrant out for her arrest at the time she disappeared. One thing Camille would never ever do is leave her daughter behind. It's just not, it's just not possible unless she met with foul play. Do they have actual evidence of foul play? No. At the same time, they went almost a decade with having no investigation done. So there was no evidence collected, no witnesses being interviewed. That's a decade worth of time where nothing was being done. And any evidence that would have been fresh is just gone. Camille is believed to be an endangered missing person though. I think it got to a point where foul play is now considered a more likely scenario. However, they have not announced any suspects or persons of interest. I want to say they looked into her recent boyfriend, but I also don't know how thoroughly they did that. Because again, after two weeks, they deleted her missing persons file. And then the ex-husband who became abusive. Again, I'm not 100% sure how thoroughly they looked into him. Camille had told people in the days leading up to the last time anyone saw her that she was fearful and possibly afraid of someone. But that's all kind of meaningless if police never looked into it. The problem with cases like Camille's is that I think a lot of times police and generally the public, they seem to just not care because of her involvement with uh, sex work and drugs. That somehow all of that just doesn't make her a person. That why should we care about someone like that? That's the mentality, unfortunately, with so many cases like this. And so a lot of cases go unsolved like this for those reasons. But not one single person is perfect. Camille is somebody's mom someone's daughter. She is a human being. We've all made choices in our life that may not have been the best choices, but it doesn't mean that we don't deserve to be looked for or that we don't deserve justice. Camille deserves it just as much as anyone else does. And so somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth about what happened to Camille that day. Her daughter deserves the answers. Her family deserves to lay her to rest if that's the case. You can report your information anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. If you have any information about the disappearance of Camille Dardanes Dodson, please call 702-229-2907. Apparently, he was flirting with one of their girlfriends, so I guess that meant he needed to die. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Christopher Gray. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Christopher Gray was 25 years old, and he lived with his friend Annie in Groton, Vermont. Annie was actually Christopher's, not only his friend, but also his legal guardian. Christopher had a developmental disability and needed a little bit of supervision and care. However, he was still fully capable of working and socializing and all of that. Christopher had a job at the Walmart in Haverhill, New Hampshire, and he was an excellent employee. They all said that he had a heart of gold and was always kind to every person he met, even if people weren't being kind to him. He was also a, a very trusting person, at times a little too trusting, which his family and friends would say that kind of was a part of his developmental disability, that he just had a more trusting nature, a little more naive. On October 6, 2008, Christopher was scheduled to work at the Walmart, and it was confirmed he got off at 11.30 p.m. Now, a few hours prior, he had actually called his friend Annie and said, Hey, I'm not going to be home tonight. I'm going to be hanging out with some friends. I'll be home tomorrow. But then tomorrow never came in terms of him coming home, and Annie got very concerned. When he still wasn't home by the following morning after that, she would report him missing. They had called his work... And they confirmed that Christopher did in fact work on October 6th and he left at 11.30. He was scheduled to work the next day but was a no-show. So police are able to obtain the surveillance footage from that Walmart. Walmart is very well known for having a massive amount of security cameras. They cover everything. Well, it did see a black vehicle with like a red strip around it. it had pulled up in front of the Walmart and then an individual in a yellow sweatshirt got out and entered the store. 
Now, the cameras then picture Christopher Gray leaving, but then going right back into the store because he left his jacket. So it catches him going in and then back out. And then someone is seen opening the door of that black vehicle in front of the store so that Christopher can get inside of it, which he did. And it appeared that there were at least two or three people in that car, other than Christopher. Now, one of the detectives actually recognized the vehicle, and he believes that vehicle belonged to this guy here, Michael Robbie, who was actually in a jail cell at the time of the disappearance. However, Michael's girlfriend, Amber Talbot, was driving his car. So they go to the home where Amber was living in with Michael, even though he was in jail, but she's not home. They leave a business card, and unbelievably, she calls police back. Amber, by the way, just so happened to also be an employee of that Walmart. And when the black car pulled up to the front of the, of the store, there was a point where she got out of the car and entered the Walmart as if she was looking for someone and then went back to the car, Charlotte followed shortly by Christopher. And so they know that for sure, she was one of the last people to ever see Christopher. And they wanted to know if she knew more. According to her, um, she told police that Christopher had asked her for a ride that night after work. She agreed and she went there with two of her friends. Timothy Smith, and Anthony Howe. Amber then tells police that they dropped Christopher off somewhere, I guess, around Newberry Crossing. But then she changes her story and says, well, actually, they dropped her, him off at a home in Newberry. But then they talk to Anthony Howe, and he tells them that, he, that they actually drove Christopher to the home that Amber and Michael lived in. And Anthony Howe seemed to be, he just wanted, it looked like, to cooperate with police. He said that they all went to the house, including Christopher. They had a bonfire in the backyard. And then Christopher and Timothy got into some kind of argument, which led into a fist fight. And then at the end of that fight, uh, Timothy pulled out two different knives and stabbed Christopher multiple times with both knives. Anthony would then later admit that he helped Timothy hide Christopher's now deceased body, that they buried him on the property, and then tried to hide the blood that was all over the bonfire area with paint and water. So police bring in Timothy and he confirms the story. Timothy then wrote an apology letter to Christopher's family. That letter said, my name is Timothy Smith and I would like to say I'm sorry for your loss. Me and Chris ended up getting into a fight and I ended up stabbing him. I came out clean and I told the cops everything. He was a very good guy and he didn't deserve it. I am very sorry for what I have done. He did not deserve what I did to him. He was a hard worker. Thanks, Timothy Smith. End quote. Gee, you also could have just, you know, not stabbed him. Within a couple of days, Christopher's body was located on the property that Michael and Amber lived on. But the police were not necessarily believing the motive that was given. That this was like a spur of the moment, they got into a fight and he just got stabbed. Well, police then listened to the jailhouse calls between Michael Robbie and his girlfriend, Amber. And Michael had said to Amber, is it done? He asked her, did they clean it up? implying that he knew that Christopher Gray was going to die. So police find out that because Amber worked at that Walmart, Michael got this idea that Christopher had been flirting with Amber. And when Michael found out while he was in jail, he wanted Christopher to get beaten up for it. And so he orchestrated this so that Timothy and Anthony would do this beating up. And so that was the motive for this whole thing. So all four of them were charged with connections to this case. Amber, Anthony, and Timothy, they all pled guilty to second degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Michael Robbie pled guilty to assault, conspiracy to commit assault, hindering apprehension, and conspiring to hinder apprehension. The phone calls never said anything about murder, so they could not pin the murder on him. He only was talking about assault and, you know, beating Christopher up. So that's why he got lesser charges. Amber was sentenced to 20 to 50 years in prison. Timothy and Anthony were given 40 years. And Michael was sentenced to 20 to 40 years. A kind and innocent man murdered because they believed he was flirting with Amber. The stupid shit people do. In a matter of minutes, she was taken, never to be seen alive again. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Courtney Clayton. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Courtney Clayton was just seven years old. 
described as kind of a tomboy. She could hit a baseball better than most boys her age. She loved to race people in the neighborhood, and many would describe her as just the chattiest and happiest little girl. As a matter of fact, while she did really well in school, she got in trouble a lot at school because she kept talking, but it was always about something, you know, positive. She also had an 11-year-old brother, and the family was living in Stamford, Texas. They had recently moved from San Diego. Now, the area of Stamford, Texas at that time was very small. It had a population of like 4,000 people, and it was regarded as an incredibly safe neighborhood. A neighborhood where kids can go out and just be on the streets playing, and they could take a little quick walk down the streets without having to worry. But even in the presumed safest neighborhoods, there can always be a monster. It was September 2nd, 1988. At approximately 8.30 p.m., Courtney was given permission by her parents to walk down the street, which is like a block, to a little corner market called the M-System food store. She was going there to buy a soda. Her dad gave her some money, and her older brother was going to be following just behind her, but Courtney left ahead of him. By the time her brother arrives at the store, Courtney is no longer there. She was supposed to wait for him. According to the cashier inside, Courtney was there and she purchased a soda. She was four cents shy. The cashier remembers telling Courtney, don't worry about it, you can bring me the four cents tomorrow. And then Courtney walked out of the store. The cashier had worked there for a long time and she knew Courtney and her brother really well. Her brother got to the store at about 8.55 p.m. He waited a few minutes and he walked back to the house. Along the way, he looked for his sister. But when he got back to the house, she wasn't there. He told their parents, and immediately they began looking for her. When they couldn't find her, they called police to report her missing. There would be a couple of witnesses who would come forward to also confirm they saw Courtney just outside of the convenience store. They saw her at 8.53 p.m., which lines up with the time frame of when the cashier saw her leaving the store. Unfortunately, this was back at the time. This is 1988. There weren't really cameras everywhere. The witness saw this seven-year-old girl talking to two men in a vehicle. She believes the men were in a Ford Torino. This witness, who was pulling into the parking lot at 8.53, would later go under hypnosis to get a description of the, one of the men she saw. And this is the composite drawing of one of those men. Meanwhile, Courtney is still missing. They're putting this image out in the news, but no one is providing them with any information. They're getting a couple tips here and there, but nothing checks out. They search the entire town. They search through all the wooded areas. They even drain a local pond. Nothing. They find her nowhere. The FBI becomes involved. They don't get any ransom calls. And they never were able to identify that vehicle or its driver. Six months later, they would get the heartbreaking news. Roughly 50 miles away from the corner store where she was last seen, someone had been walking through this field and found a human skull, later determined to be the skull of a young child. Once police were notified, they searched the area and they found more skeletal remains. Eventually, they were able to identify those remains as belonging to Courtney Clayton. However, they were not able to determine exactly how she died, but it was still ruled a homicide. In September of 1991, two men were arrested because they had been seen trying to lure young boys into their car. At first, it was believed that these may be the same two men that were seen in the car talking to Courtney. However, both men passed polygraph tests. They also investigated the two men further, and they were cleared as suspects in Courtney's case. And ever since then, there has been no suspects, no persons of interest, barely any tips or leads, and her case has gone cold. This is again the man that was seen in that car, who was never identified back then. This is a 2016 age progression drawing of that same man. Now, this is 2024 I'm filming this, but, you know, if alive today, he may still resemble something like this. But even with this image out there, still no one has come forward. Courtney Clayton had just started second grade a few days before her murder. She was excited for the school year. She had a lot of hopes and she had a lot of dreams. But unfortunately, none of those dreams get to come true. Because someone, a stranger, a monster, took her and killed her. Somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth, and perhaps that someone is you. You can always report your information anonymously. You do not have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. If you have any information about the murder of seven-year-old Courtney Clayton from Stamford, Texas, please call 1-800-346-3243. Police body cam playing. Officers fighting with defendant. Stop resisting! Stop resisting! Defendant. <laughs>
I'm not resisting, but I'm not going willingly. <laughs> Judge, how long has it been since you've worked? Defendant, two years. Judge, what have you been doing for two years? Public defender. <laughs> Breaking the law? DA, your honor, I believe they are rejecting the generous plea offer that was extended. Public defender. That's correct, your honor. And for the record, her generous offer was to plead guilty as charged. Judge, sir, you were required to appear in person, not virtually. Your bond is forfeited and you are to turn yourself into the sheriff's office immediately. Defendant. Nah, I'll just wait until I have the money for bond and then I'll turn myself in. Is that cool with you? It was not cool with them. Hearing on protective order. Defendant. Judge, do you believe in love? Judge. Yes, but love isn't pain or violence. Defendant. <laughs> Facts, bruh. Judge. Love is a verb. It's an action. I'll use it in a sentence. I love holding abusers accountable. Damn! After an OP was granted. Judge. Sir, do you own any firearms? Respondent. Yes, I do. Judge. Wait, haven't we been talking about how you're on felony probation? How do you own guns? Respondent. Judge, that doesn't mean I can't have them. It just means I can't get caught. You know what I mean? I think that's kind of how the law works, respondent. Defendant appears wearing shorts and a tank top. Judge, you know what those tank tops are called in my day? Wife beaters. You wore a wife beater to your domestic violence trial. Jesus Christ. Judge admonished defendant about dirty drug tests while on drug probation. Defendant. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you, Your Honor. I did smoke a little crystal meth, but it's totally not my fault. I was under the influence of alcohol when I did it. <laughs> okay. Judge calls case. Old, older male attorney. Your Honor, I'm here, but I don't know where opposing counsel is. I haven't seen anybody today. Young female attorney standing right next to him. I'm right here, Your Honor. Eesh. Male defense attorney during closing arguments before a jury. If I was driving with my mother and we were stopped by the police and they accused my mother of having stolen lingerie, I would say it was me because my mom is not going to jail on my watch. Would I look good in the women's lingerie? <laughs> Probably. At least he's honest. I have two more true crime docu-series to recommend. Well, I guess not really docu-series because each episode is a new case. Anyway. Now, I'm watching both of these shows on Max, HBO. I don't know if they're anywhere else, though. Maybe on Investigation Discovery, not 100% sure. But the first one is called The Real Murders on Elm Street. Yes. Obviously, that's a play on to A Nightmare on Elm Street. No, this does not have anything to do with Freddy Krueger. But they have managed to find uh, true crime cases, murder cases that occurred on streets throughout the United States that are called, that are on Elm Street. I don't know... The longevity of this because i don't know how many possible murders they could find that actually occurred on an elm street somewhere in the world but i believe the first season is going to be six episodes they've aired the first three there's still three more to go as of me filming this uh the first episode of this though it actually was really creepy to me it was really unnerving it's about a, a teenage killer named daniel laplante I actually covered his case like a couple of like back in 2021, but there were aspects of the case that I did not know. Like this dude hid in the walls of a family's home and it's just the way they displayed like the recreations. And I'm not normally a fan of recreations, but they, they did such, it was such a good job. It was so creepy and it was like, it's real. Like this really happened. But anyway, you should definitely check this out. This is not a paid sponsorship by anyone. But I've actually just double-checked, and actually I think this show is also on Investigation Discovery. But again, I'm watching it on Max. And then the other show is called Cabin in the Woods. Okay, that one's also that one's definitely on Investigation Discovery, as well as Max. This is not to be confused with one of my favorite horror movies, The Cabin in the Woods. A genius freaking horror movie if you've ever seen one. But this is again is a true crime show and this is specifically about cases that occurred, murder cases and stuff that occurred in cabins or in homes that are located in a wooded area. Kind of like a nightmare scenario for a lot of people. You know, if you don't like camping or if you don't like staying in cabins that are surrounded by dark woods, you may you this show may freak you out. <laughs> but again, real life true crime cases um, that occurred in these scenarios. Again, the longevity of this, I'm not sure. I I know there's at least six episodes that they plan to do. They've just aired three. So these are, both these shows are still currently airing. But this one is definitely, it's, it's freaky. And it's why I would never, ever, I, why I don't like camping, why I don't like hiking, and why I don't stay in cabins in woods. <laughs> 
I don't know if they're going to cover the Caddy Cabin murders, but that's like, to me, one of the scariest cabin murders ever. Anyway, check out Cabin in the Woods and The Real Murders on Elm Street, Investigation Discovery, and or Max. Okay. Her soon-to-be killer watched her from a window from across the way, and still nobody knows who that is. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Dana Bailey. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Dana Bailey was 21 years old, described as a happy and extremely nice individual. She was super intelligent, and she was attending Penn State University in State College, Pennsylvania. She was actually majoring in senior health planning and administration. When this case occurred, it's actually spring break, and so most of the students are out of town. This is what her apartment uh, building looked like back in 1987 when this occurred. But she had her own apartment here, and she was there during spring break on her own. It was the morning of March 5th, 1987. Dana Bailey's mom would actually go to Dana's apartment to just check up on her. But she didn't answer the door when she knocked, and so she entered the apartment, and she discovered something that no mother should ever have to see. Her 21-year-old daughter had been stabbed to death. She was nude and she was posed in a sexual position. And I think later they would determine that she was sexually assaulted. Dana did have a fiance. She was actually going to be getting married sometime within that year. And she had actually just gotten home from visiting her fiance who lived in a different state from what I understand. So I know that he was questioned and everything, and there's just no way he could have done this because he was confirmed to be in a completely different place. And so this really looked more as if it was a stranger on stranger type thing. So nowadays, this is what her apartment building is. And it was still above like a restaurant, I believe. Now at the time, over on this side, this building right here, uh, that particular where the X is, that building was being remodeled. So real quick sidetrack here, a couple of Penn State students, they actually did a, a short documentary on this case. It is called Murder in Happy Valley. Um, that's the title of it right there if you wanted to check it out. That's where I got some of these images from. But they found shoe prints in that apartment that they also found in Dana's apartment. And there was evidence here that someone had been like squatting there or had been there for long periods of time. And that window would look directly into what was Dana's apartment window at that time. So they believed that that person had been stalking her from that other a building and eventually uh, managed to break into her apartment. He entered through a kitchen window. He had actually cut the screen. The murder weapon, the knife, was found in the apartment and it was confirmed to be from a knife set that Dana owned. So the killer did not bring a weapon, he just used one that he found. I believe they found like this big bucket outside of the kitchen window that they believe the killer stood on to cut the window to get in. In 2003, police there in State College would get a letter, an anonymous letter, and that mentioned two individuals' names who I guess were someone that the police should look into with regards to this murder, but they never found out who wrote the letter, and they're, they're still wondering that to this day. The names of those two people, I'm not sure if they ever actually released them publicly, and I don't know if they ever actually made a connection between those names and anything to do with Dana or her life or her apartment. And this is an interesting little side note. In 2005, this man here, Ray Grieghar, was actually the district attorney who would be handling Dana's case. What's interesting is that he himself disappeared in 2005. I've covered his case before. They don't know if he was murdered, if he ended his own life, or where he is. They don't know if it has any connection to do with Dana Bailey. It's just an interesting coincidence, perhaps. But to this day, nobody knows who Dana Bailey's killer is. Or perhaps someone does know, but they don't want to come forward. If you have information, you can report it anonymously to police. You don't have to say who you are. All you have to say is what you know. If you have any information about the murder of Dana Bailey, please call 814-234-7150. A newlywed couple on a cruise were both found dead inside their stateroom. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Darla Mellinger Banner. Viewer discretion is advised. On October 2nd, 2014, Darla Mellinger married John Banner. Both of them in their 50s were also retired. About two months after they were married, police were called to their home for an incident. 
The couple had just gotten home from a honeymoon cruise, and they were, I guess, unpacking. John had this, what he said was like an old war relic uh, knife, and he had taken it out to show Darla. Well, then they both would say that Darla began to walk towards John when she tripped over a throw rug and then landed on the knife, which stabbed her somewhere like near her chest. She was rushed to the hospital, and she would be released later that evening. And they just labeled it a freak accident. Fast forward to March 29th, 2015. Darla and John were going on their second cruise. This one was for Easter. They boarded the MS Rindum in uh, Florida. The couple, by the way, they actually lived in Salem, Ohio. Well, on April 2nd, 2015, when the ship was docked in Puerto Rico, John and Darla were both found dead in their stateroom. The FBI was called immediately, and they were in and out of the ship taking photos, collecting evidence. Both of them had met relatively gruesome ends. The unconfirmed reports state that John had, I guess, seen a text message on Darla's phone that was from another man. And this really angered him. And he responded by striking her over the head with some kind of object. He then tried to strangle her, choke her, asphyxiate her, and, you know, beat her until she died. Then John, realizing what he just did, had, I guess, fastened some kind of rope together, and he hung himself in the stateroom. This was a very unfortunate and tragic murder-suicide. And, you know, the evidence was definitely there to support it. And no one really questions that at all. Like, you know, there was pretty much that was the story. I know the estate holders of Darla's estate uh, would later file a lawsuit against the people who were running John's estate, uh, suing for like close to half a million dollars. But I, I don't know if there was an outcome to that. And honestly, it, it sounds like with that story back in December, it sounds like he tried to harm her then. So it sounds like this was like a history of like a temper, anger issues. And as we've discussed before, women who are in these types of domestic violence relationships, it's not easy to just get out and walk away because generally they, feel for, they fear for their lives, thinking that if they do try to leave, they'll get killed. And quite honestly, it's an epidemic all over the world. It's just sad that Darla was not able to escape it with her life. His dad asked him, will you be home later? He responds with, that's the plan. He has not been seen since. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of David McAllister. Viewer discretion is advised. The story occurred here in Bettendorf, Iowa, where David and his family lived. David was one of three children. He had two brothers. David was a really personable guy, extremely friendly and outgoing, and he had a very close relationship with his mom. The two of them, she would say, were actually baptized on the same day. And faith was something that was uh, really important to him. David also had a job. He was working as a roofer, something he absolutely loved doing. He was definitely an outdoorsy person. He is someone who loves to go camping and hiking, being one with nature. He loves spending time at the park. I don't know the exact circumstances, and I don't want to speculate. But sometime, I guess, before this case occurred, like a year or two prior, David was dealing with some personal issues that he was working on. He began to do this thing where he would sort of leave home for a long period of time. He would hitchhike. He, you know, he went to states like Arizona, Kansas, Colorado. But he would always come home and he would always communicate with his family, especially his mom. The two of them text basically every single day. In the early morning hours of May 11th, 2017, David's mom woke up and saw that David was not at the house. So she texts him and he says, I'm just out doing some walking and that he was thinking about kind of going around spreading the word. He left the house with his Bible, um, his backpack and his cell phone. David's father did see him that morning. And before David set out for the day, his dad asked him, you know, are you going to be home later tonight? And he, David responded with, yep, that's the plan. He gave absolutely no indication that he had not planned to come home. But that's exactly what happened. David never came home. Eventually, he is reported missing. He's 22 years old at the time of the disappearance. And you always have to deal with the police saying, well, he is an adult. He could have just gone off on his own. There was no proof or any evidence of foul play. But they were able to finally trace his cell phone and kind of find out his movements that day. 
So his cell phone did ping that day, I guess off the Ambrose Tower, which is in the vicinity of the Vanderveer Botanical Park. This is a place that David would go to frequently to take walks, to just sort of breathe in the fresh air, enjoy nature. So it didn't surprise people that that's where his cell phone had pinged on that day. But his cell phone hasn't pinged anywhere ever since, and no trace of David has ever been found. Like I said earlier, David was not the type of person who would just stop communicating with his family. He was extremely close with his family. And his mom, you know, said she has that gut feeling that something bad happened to him. David had a very trusting nature. He was a very inviting person, especially even with like strangers. But she felt that he came into contact with likely somebody he knew and trusted. Her gut tells her that somebody killed him. She says she has no proof of that, but that's just what her motherly instinct is saying. And motherly instinct is usually pretty spot on. He is this 22-year-old guy uh, who just walked out of his house and vanished into thin air. This happened in 2017, just not that, not that long ago. We have cameras everywhere. We're able, we have GPSs in our pockets. We have eyes everywhere. People are recording everything. The fact that David has never been seen by anyone does not give that much hope that he is still out there alive. But he still could be. There is always that possibility that David chose to fall off the grid. But his story has been on the news, and it's just, if someone had seen him, there someone is going to say something. He can't tell people, you know, can't tell every single person he comes in contact with, you didn't see me if you saw me. Does that make sense? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> It has now been seven years at the time of me filming this in September of 2024. David would be about 29 years old or so. And somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth about what happened to David McAllister that day in 2017. Someone might have seen him in that park. Something may have happened where he trusted this individual. And then who knows? If that person is you who has information, you can report your information anonymously. You do not have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. If you have any information about the disappearance of David McAllister, please contact the Bettendorf Police Department at 563-344-4015. 34 years ago, a woman vanished from her job at a gas station. And now all these years later, she is still missing. Hello, True Crimerers. This is the case of Deborah Poe. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Deborah Poe was 26 years old and living in Orlando, Florida. Deborah, though, grew up in Northern Virginia and she had all these aspirations of one day becoming a dancer. I know she did ballet for some time. But by October of 1989, she decided to leave Northern Virginia and move to Florida with a friend. At that point, Deborah was working two jobs. She worked a day job at a newspaper, and then she was making some extra money working the overnight shift at a Circle K. So this is the building that used to be the Circle K. It's obviously now a different gas station, but this is the exact one where she worked at and where this case occurred. This is obviously a, a recreation, but on the night of February 4th, 1990, Deborah was working her overnight shift. Something her family and friends really tried to encourage her to leave that job and to not do this because working overnight shifts in stores like this could be quite dangerous. But Deborah always said, you know, she would be okay. Deborah did have a boyfriend at the time, and I guess he would go to the convenience store sometimes and spend a few hours there with her as like a form of protecting her. He had been there that night, but I think he left sometime after 1 or 1.30 in the morning. Other customers said that they saw her working her shift sometime a little after three o'clock. But then after that, nobody saw her ever again. Again, recreation. But at about 4.30 a.m., one of Deborah's friends would go to the store and he noticed that she wasn't in it. And becoming concerned, he would contact police. The police searched the store. They didn't find any sign of Deborah. They did find some of her folded up clothes. They found a coffee cup and they found some paperwork on the ground that she was looking through. But there was no signs of a struggle anywhere in the store. Nothing was tossed over or anything. No blood, nothing. The cash register was locked and no money was stolen from it. Outside the store, Deborah's car was parked in her normal spot. It was locked. There were no indications that anyone tried to break into the car. Her purse was in the back seat. It had all of its cash in it, credit cards, etc. Nothing was stolen. But Deborah, she's gone. That's, she's the only thing missing from the store. 
they would bring in uh, scent dogs to see if they could pick up her trail. The scent dogs would pick up on her scent towards the rear of the store and then under this wood slat fence and then in the direction towards an apartment complex, but then the trail stopped. So if the dogs were picking up on something, it was evident to police that at some point, Deborah got into a vehicle. And so at that point, they, they listed this as an abduction. Someone had taken her. So sometime after the story broke, a woman would come forward to police that at some point around 3.30, maybe 3.40 in the morning, she entered that Circle K. But Deborah was not there. However, there was a very tall man behind the counter. This is a description of the man she saw behind the counter. He was wearing like a Megadeth t-shirt and he did not appear that he really knew what he was doing. She asked for a pack, pack of cigarettes. He said, you know, you shouldn't smoke, but he didn't, he couldn't locate where the cigarettes were that she wanted. She had to point them out to him. To her, it appeared that this guy did not actually work there. So did she walk in on whoever abducted Deborah? Or did she walk in on someone who maybe walked into the store before her, saw that there was no one there and was trying to rob the place, but then had to play dumb and pretend that he's a, a worker there? No one really knew. They put his image out there, but nothing, nothing came of it. However, in November of 1996, police would come forward to state that they believe this man was the boyfriend of one of Deborah's co-workers. But they were never able to actually locate him or question him. And they even believed that he was likely just a customer who for whatever reason went behind the counter and rang up this customer. Seems a little odd to me, but he hasn't been ruled out as a suspect. In 1998, Deborah Poe is declared legally dead. And then in 2002, police have announced that they had a suspect in the case. However, they never named that suspect publicly. They did say that it was a friend of Deborah's. Some speculate it was her boyfriend, Scott. Scott did pass a lie detector test, however, after their investigation, but the police have not said that it was her boyfriend. In recent years, they got tips about where her body may be, but they dug and they didn't find anything. And Deborah Poe is still missing and presumed dead. In all likelihood, Deborah Poe was abducted that night and more than likely she was murdered but the police still need the public's help in trying to solve this case and to find Deborah so that she can come home and that her family can lay her to rest. Somebody somewhere out there knows the truth and perhaps that someone is you. If you have information, you can contact the Orlando County Sheriff's Department in Florida at 407-836-3700. In 1987, a body was pulled out of a California mine shaft, and to this day, they are no closer to finding out who put him there. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Dennis Palmer. Viewer discretion is advised. Unfortunately, I don't really have a lot of background information on Dennis. All I really know is that at the time of this case, he is 33 years old, living in Jackson, California, and he was dating a woman named Pam Underwood. Pam Underwood, pictured here during a search for Dennis later on, she would later tell police that she left the home she shared with Dennis sometime around 6.30 a.m. on August 3, 1987. And when she left the house, Dennis was still asleep in bed. Now, she knew that Dennis was planning on visiting his parents that day. He was going to be traveling from Jackson to Alpine County, California. But Pam fully expected that he would be home later that night. He wasn't. When she got home later, his truck was gone and so was he. She waits several hours later and he still isn't home. So she will call Dennis's parents and say, hey, you know, has he left your house yet? They told her he hasn't even been here. He never got here. And so almost immediately his parents knew something was wrong and they would travel themselves to Jackson to help search for him. A few weeks later, on August 16th, 1987, as searches for Dennis are still going, two of Dennis's friends spot his truck. And I guess it's on East Clinton Road and it's being driven by a man named Nick Thomas. And because he was in a stolen truck, he was arrested. However, he denied having anything to do with whatever may have happened to Dennis. And then, unfortunately, the search for Dennis would end a few days after this. On August 20th, 1987, the body of Dennis Palmer was found in a mine shaft on his property. So the day he disappeared, he never actually left his property. 
Within a few days or so, detectives would announce that this was being investigated now as a homicide case. This was not some kind of accidental death or a fall. Dennis had actually been beaten. He also appeared to have been run over by a vehicle and he had two gunshot wounds. And then his body was just thrown into a mine shaft on his own property. And it sounds like he was run over probably by his own truck. So detectives will circle back to the man who was found driving his stolen truck. Well, this guy says he found the truck just abandoned. So he just took it. But there was nothing linking this man directly to this murder. So they really couldn't do anything about that. Meanwhile, his girlfriend is assisting police searching the entire property to see if they can find the bullets or the you know, shell casings, but they had no luck. Then in 1988, police announced that they have two persons of interest in this murder, Robert Allen and Vern Van Paul. They got those names from Nick Thomas, the guy who had been found in the stolen truck. Well, apparently Nick Thomas told his cellmate while awaiting his, you know, trials and stuff with the stolen truck that it was these two men who actually murdered Dennis. But Nick was not a part of it. He was not there when it happened. And then they get some more information from a three and a half year old girl. Robert Allen had a three year old daughter named Vera. Well, apparently Vera was with him when they killed Dennis. The child's mother, Gloria Allen, would also tell police that Dennis Palmer would go to the bar she worked at all the time and that the two of them were friends. But Robert Allen, her ex, uh, did not like that. So there were some issues and discrepancies with the autopsy report. It wasn't determined that he had been shot or run over until later on. Before that was revealed, this three-year-old girl would actually tell police that her daddy ran over this man and shot him. Then his body was exhumed after all of this, and it's determined that's exactly what happened. A child psychologist would interview Vera, and they determined that she was telling the truth. Eventually, they got warrants to search both of their properties. They collected several pieces of evidence. However, Neither of them have ever been charged or indicted or anything with involvement in this murder. The family has had to keep going back to the sheriff's department year after year saying, what are you guys doing? Why haven't you filed charges? It's clear they did it. Then there was drama with it. Gloria Allen had then filed for full custody of her daughter Vera, and then people began to speculate that she made all of this up in order to get him in jail so that she can get full custody of her daughter. The Amador County Sheriff's Department, who was the one investigating this, have said that they have a legal obligation to withhold charges until they have enough evidence to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. There was even a point where the DA that would have been doing this case actually offered an immunity deal to Mr. Van Paul, which caused a lot of uproar in the community, especially with Dennis's family, understandably. But it doesn't sound like that ever actually happened. And now it's been 37 years. They have never arrested anyone. They have never charged anyone. They've never done anything. Dennis Palmer was murdered. They have an eyewitness. They have a second witness as well, the man who stole the car, but nothing has been done. I'm guessing this is due to a lack of physical evidence which, you know, to be fair, is kind of essential, unless the circumstantial evidence is strong enough. Will the young girl's memory stand the test of time? She was only three and a half years old. And so it just sounds like the case they have is very weak. But the family is still fighting for justice, still trying desperately to get an answer here and get justice for Dennis. So if you have any information that can help them, please contact the Amador County Sheriff's Department at 209-223-6515. She tricked her own children into digging their father's grave. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Douglas Couch. Viewer discretion is advised. Linda Couch would meet her husband, Douglas, at some point in the early 1970s. They hit it off, they ended up getting married, and then they had three children together. The family would end up living here in this house in Price Hill, Ohio. On October 14th, 1984, Linda would tell her children that their father, Douglas, had left them and he wasn't coming back. The kids didn't really find this all that strange because Douglas was someone who had a temper. But to Douglas's parents, they were like, well, this is unusual because they hadn't heard from him in like 10, 12 days. What in was interesting to Douglas's father was that Linda had 
uh, Douglas's dad come over uh, days prior, and he, along with their children, would dig a hole in their backyard. And Linda gave the excuse of, well, I want to start my garden, and there are some drainage issues that is preventing me from doing that, so I need this hole dug. And they did it. On October 23rd, 1984, it all came to a head. Police were called to the Couch residence. And it, it sounds like it had to do with the fact that, you know, Douglas was missing and hadn't talked to anyone. So the police are actually talking to Linda in the backyard. And they ask her, well, do you know where Douglas is? And she says, I do. As a matter of fact, you're standing on him. So they got out some digging equipment. They dug up the hole where her kids and father-in-law had dug up days prior. They find a carpet, and in the carpet is the body of Douglas Couch. He had a gunshot wound to the back of his head, and it was done execution style. And Linda, she said she did it. She said she shot him. But it was an accident, she said. According to Linda, there was a lot of abuse in the house. She would tell police that Douglas physically abused her daily, and he also abused the kids. From what I understand, the kids would confirm most of that, stating that he did beat them in the house. But Linda also told police that Douglas would repeatedly rape her and had his friends watch him while he was doing it. Nobody could corroborate that story whatsoever. The kids, or at least one of the kids, says that's a complete lie. She said on October 13th, 1984, that they, her and Douglas got into a fight. Douglas took out a gun. They got into a little tussle, and the gun ended up in her hands, and it accidentally went off, shooting him in the back of his head, killing him. What's interesting, though, is that police, well, they, they found something that would prove that was probably not true. They found out that on September 28th, several weeks before this murder would have happened, Linda took the deed of the house and put it solely in her name. On October 8th, she would send the kids to one of their family's homes to stay the week. Then on October 9th, she went to a department store where she purchased a 22 caliber weapon. And she bought the bullets, too. One of her own kids would say that Linda was taking out loans from several banks in the weeks leading up to this. All of that indicated that Linda was actually planning to murder her husband. This was premeditated and planned. After she shot Douglas, she, they believe, hid him in the basement until the kids came back home, and that's when she had them dig the hole with her father-in-law. And then she would eventually move the body um, to the hole. So Linda Couch was charged with the murder, and she claimed it was still self-defense. There would be a lot of testimony that did confirm that the abuse was definitely happening. And you could potentially say, well, this was self-defense if it did happen in, a, in an altercation where he was beating her and she did that. But that wasn't the case here. She she plotted this. And at the same time, you're like, if he was like if he was a domestic abuser, what do you do? You know, what do you do? It's not it's not an easy answer. But Linda Couch would be convicted of the murder. She was sentenced to life in prison with the option for parole. She would actually be featured on the Netflix show I Am a Killer. And she has been denied parole every opportunity since. One of her daughters has actually come out and said that she does not believe her mother should ever be free. That her mother is a schemer, she is a manipulator, she is a liar. And that while the abuse was true, she said there were options for Linda to get out. But Linda did not explore any of those options and she believes that she didn't even want to. That she truly just wanted to kill her husband. Some of the other family members, though, are disagreeing with her, saying, you know, well, if she was being abused and the kids are being abused, she may have been doing that to protect everyone. It's a very, uh, it's a very tricky and very uncomfortable situation all around. But Linda Couch is still in prison and her next parole hearing is not set until 2025. This is another Worst Freak Accidents. Viewer discretion is advised. This story occurred here at the Five Times Square building in Manhattan in New York. The building, which opened in 2002, is 38 stories tall. And it was just two years after the building opened when this incident took place. 63-year-old Carl de Klerk, who was originally from Guyana, but now living in Queens with his family, he was an elevator operator. On an August day in 2004, at approximately 4.30 p.m., Carl was in the elevator writing it down. When all of a sudden, something happens that causes one of the cables to snap. 
causing a malfunction that actually makes the elevator skyrocket to the top of the building at a very high speed. The elevator then slams into the top of the elevator shaft, causing Carl to launch up and then slam down. The force was so strong that Carl was killed instantly. The sound could be heard all over the building, and people in the building felt the impact. I do know that the de Klerk family would end up filing a lawsuit against the elevator manufacturer, but unfortunately, I do not know the end result. The body of Elijah Vu has been found. Hello, true crimeers. This is another case update. Viewer discretion is advised. I do apologize, I'm a few days late on this update because this happened about three days ago. I just somehow missed it. But if you recall, the three-year-old boy was reported missing in Wisconsin back on February 20th, 2024. He was initially reported missing by 39-year-old Jesse Vang, who was dating uh, Elijah's mother, Katrina Bauer, who's 31 years old. It was pretty much believed by everyone that they were involved in whatever happened to Elijah. And the police had, soon after the disappearance, had arrested both of them and charged them both with child neglect. Jesse Vang was charged with felony child neglect. Then hit Elijah's mother, Katrina Bauer, was charged with felony child neglect and resisting slash obstructing a police officer charges. Elijah's body was found a little more than three miles away from where he was last seen, and he was actually found on September 7th, which was about 10 days ago. But they announced that they confirmed that it was his remains uh, about three days ago. They used DNA to match it to him. I am filming this at 8.50 a.m. on September 17th, 2024, and at this time they have not confirmed what his cause of death was. And... There have not been any updated charges on the couple yet. But I'm sure once they determine that this was a homicide, which let's just be real here, it likely was. I guess it could have also been some kind of accidental death and then they concealed his body. I'm not sure. But it does sound like to most people he was likely killed somewhere else and then just disposed in the woods. It was an area that the police and volunteers had already searched before. So it is possible, again, this is just speculation, that he may have been moved to that location after a search was done. Katrina had put Elijah in the care of Jesse Vang, and it was Jesse Vang's apartment where Elijah was last seen. And she put Elijah in the care of Jesse Vang to teach him to be a man, which would end in the three-year-old boy's death. I've been doing this for, oh God, about almost th three and a half years and telling stories in cases about you know like this is it it just it just never never gets easier to tell these stories and i just i cannot fathom how a, a grown adult could do something like this to a three-year-old child i just i'll never understand if they are responsible for what happened to him, um, I hope they spend the rest of their lives in prison. And I hope that soon Elijah gets the justice he very rightfully deserves. <laughs> Fuck it. I'm fucking dying. <laughs> Okay, so this is only for Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon fans. I was scrolling through the videos with this sound and I came across this one. So he says, I love recommending Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon to people because there's politics and dragons and sword fights, but you'll have to remember about 250 character names and it'll be like Amon, Damon, Aegon, and Aegon again, plus a guy named Phil or something. Then the comment section, oh my god, it's it's absolutely gold. Eddard, but they called him Ned. <laughs> Don't confuse the Tyrells, the Tullys, and the Tyrells. <laughs> Don't even get me started on all the locations. This person says, Volantis, Lease, Winterfell, Carth, Lannisport, King's Landing, and that's about all I got. I don't even know what or where the Red Keep is. <laughs> it's like the most popular thing. It's, it's where the Iron Throne is. <laughs> I'm sorry to all of you non-Game of Thrones people. I'm sorry. This is This is not for you. A scene with Reyna, Reynus, and Rhaenyra <laughs> would send a non-watcher into a coma. He responded with, and now their watch has ended. <laughs> oh, should I find the stupidest shit? So funny. They have twins, Eric and Eric, like bestie be fucking for real. <laughs> 
putting identical twins in a show with two unnamed characters is just purposely trying to confuse us. God bless America. Uh, the fact that there's... <laughs> There's a Lannister named Jason in the midst of all these Aegons is so funny to me. That, that was in House of the Dragon, right? There was just a random dude named Jason Lannister. <laughs> Did the parents just get tired? I don't understand. I don't even know they had that name in that non not real not real time frame. What am I even saying? <laughs> keeping, keeping up with the Targaryens. Uh, I just got my dad watching House of the Dragon. He keeps calling Renera Rihanna. <laughs> uh, but Phil will be spelled B H F Y L L. You forgot Balon, Aegon, Aegon, <laughs> Rayla, the other Aegon, and Robert. <laughs> Peter, but it's spelled P E T Y R. That's real. Uh, and you got siblings with the names Jaharis and Jahara and siblings that are Lenor and Lena. <laughs> Try trying to figure out how they're all related, but also married. <laughs> it's a, a whole other issue. Uh, some guy named Cheese. <laughs> Don't even get me started on all the dragon's names. I can only remember Drogon because it sounds like dragon. Fucking hell. <laughs> I will call them by descriptive factors such as Eye Patch and 2005 Gerard Way. There's six dragons with then a family with Oscar, Elmo, and Grover. You'll love it. There's also a Bran, Braun, Brienne, Brandy, Buck, Broski, and Brooklyn. <laughs> I am so stupid. <laughs> Alan, but it's House of the Dragon, so A L Y N. Eddard, Rickon, Podrick, Aegon, Damon, Rhaenyra, Rhaenys, and then there's just John. J O N. I don't remember names of characters, I only remember vibes. <laughs> My mom is always confused between Aegon and Aemond, so she just says one eye and not one eye. <laughs> oh, fuck. It's not Carl, but Q A R L. I literally have no idea who's who. I just watch and smile and nod. <laughs> and Jaceris and Luceris, but they call them Jace and Luke. <laughs> I thought Dracarys was the dragon's name. <laughs> oh my god. No, this is straight just facts. Not only over 200 characters to remember, but also fair warning, don't get attached to any of them. Like ever. Odds are, they die. So many vowels just thrown into these names. <laughs> Ned always throws me off like, it's just an off-brand name in that world. <laughs> Meet the Lannisters. Tywin, Cersei, Tyrion, and Kevin, but with an A. <laughs> Please, there's Jon, Sansa, Arya, Rickon, Rob, and Brandon? <laughs> when they brought up the Vale and the Airy, the Reach, the High and High Tower, I just had to pull out a map every time. I should get a map. I don't know, like, why are there so many Aegons? Stop naming your kids Aegon. Anyway, there's a lot more comments. It's just hilarious. Sorry to you non-Game of Thrones fans. The contents of this steamer trunk would take roughly seven years to identify. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Harper's Ferry remains. Viewer discretion is advised. The case starts here at Harper's Ferry National Historical Park, and it was near the entrance to the park. Deputy Clark Jackson Jr. from the Loudoun County, Virginia Sheriff's Office, he was patrolling that area. As he drove towards the entrance and was doing his rounds, he noticed this large steamer trunk next to a trash can. Curiosity got the better of him. He got closer to it and noticed that there was duct tape wrapped around the trunk. So he cut the duct tape off. He opened the trunk and he saw a big black duffel bag. He opened that duffel bag to find another duffel bag. When he unzipped that bag, what he said he saw was a human eye staring back at him because in that trunk was a deceased body. It was obvious to them right away that this was the remains of an elderly man. The man was brought to the coroner's office and it was determined that he had been strangled to death. He had toxic levels of a sedative in his system. He also had bruises and abrasions all over his body and blunt force trauma. They described him as being emaciated. He was grossly underweight and he was folded into that steamer trunk. But there was no identity on the man. There was no identity on in the trunk. No like name scribbled on it or anything. But it was obvious this was a murder. 
They fingerprinted the man, they took his DNA, they put all of that into their database, at least the databases that they had back in 96, and it didn't come back to a match for anyone. And they said at the time, they really, the only clue they had was there was some nail polish painted on the side of the trunk. So they put out this composite drawing of what the man would look like, hoping against hope that somebody would come forward to say, yeah, I know who that is. But nobody did. And with very, very minimal evidence, the case pretty much goes cold. And then, seven years later, the Department of Defense allows the FBI to use their fingerprint system to see their internal fingerprint database. And they got a hit. The body was that of a World War II veteran named Jack Watkins. Jasper Watkins, who would go by Jack, was born in 1920, and he lived in Richmond, Virginia. He enlisted in the U.S. Army, and after the war, he would open up his own auto shop. In 1964, he married his wife, Mary, and he took on Mary's three kids, and they loved him like a father. And then sadly, in 1989, his wife, Mary, died. Jack then found himself living in Baltimore, Maryland, living on a very modest income. When police finally discovered his name, they were able to kind of, the, the investigation opened up a lot more. They discovered that someone, despite Jack being dead for years, had been cashing his social security checks. Those checks were being sent to a P.O. box located in Ellicott City, Maryland. And they determined that whoever owned that P.O. box was likely the person responsible for what happened to Jack. And they found out their identity. A woman named Nancy Siegel. Police would orchestrate essentially kind of like a sting operation just to see if she was in fact the one taking that mail out of that P.O. box, confirming she was the one getting the social security checks. And they caught her in the act of doing it. When they confronted her, they said, well, you know, who owns this P.O. box? She says herself, her daughters, and Jack Watkins, who she claimed was still alive, living in Pennsylvania. And they're like, uh, okay, well, Jack's actually dead. We have his body. We've had his body for seven years. And then they had proof. They actually had her, I guess, on video, on camera, uh, cashing or depositing one of those Social Security checks. So they needed to know who the hell is Nancy Siegel? How does she factor into this? Did she kill him? What happened? Well, they found out she had a very long list of a criminal history, mainly consisting of defrauding people out of their money. So by the 1980s, Nancy had developed a gambling addiction, and this created a significant amount of debt for her. And she was married at this time, and because she was in such disarray, she took out a whole bunch of credit cards and loans in her husband's name without him knowing which then put her husband into $100,000 worth of debt, making him have to file for bankruptcy. They got divorced, then she remarried, and then she did the same thing to her next husband. Created loans in his name without his knowledge, but also directly stole money from him. So they divorced in the early 90s. Then she turned to a life of petty crimes like theft, robberies. She goes around neighborhoods stealing from people's mailboxes. She managed to, in, in this way, she managed to acquire some people's driver's license because they got a new one mailed to them, social security cards, and then she started to create loans and stuff like that in those people's names. This would lead to Nancy Siegel being arrested multiple times, but also in different states and cities, making it difficult, especially in the 80s and 90s, to really kind of put all of this together. And then she met Jack Watkins in 1994. And she charmed her way into him, you know, uh, becoming engaged to her. She soon manipulated him into taking out $60,000 in mortgage loans. And then did the same thing, you know, with creating and getting credit cards and loans in his name. And then all of these credit cards and loans she never paid. Nancy began to alienate Jack from his family. Like, she wouldn't let him see his own family. And I guess they found out that she started to drug him and then tried to have him committed to an institution. Then in 1995, she met a man named Eric, who was a loan broker. And then at that point, she began to fear that Jack Watkins could expose her. So at that point, she began to plot his murder. In 1996, she sold his home and moved him into her home. And then police would find out that this is pretty much the point where she begins to drug him consistently and deprive him of food, which is why when he was found dead, he was so just depleted. His body was so small. And then she drugged him to a point where it was so bad he became unconscious. And then she strangled him to death. 
hid his body in that trunk and managed to drag it out to the park. Nancy then marries Eric, the other guy she was seeing. His last name is Siegel, that's where she got that last name from. But then she goes on to defraud him of $300,000. It was just rinse and repeat for her. But by 2003, when they finally got the DNA hit, they all knew at that point, you know, people in Jack's life, because he had been reported missing, but they never were able to piece it together. Again, this is the 90s when it happened. We didn't have the communication we have now. But that's how they got the name Nancy. They began to investigate her. They found out all the stuff about her, and they brought her in for questioning. They showed her a photo of the steamer trunk, and according to police, she began to cry. She would say, oh my god, Jack was a father figure to me. He had dementia. I was his caretaker. However, according to Jack's family and according to everyone in his life and also his own medical records, there was no records of him ever having dementia. She told police, well, in May of 1996, I came home and I found that Jack had killed himself. He hung himself from the ceiling fan with an extension cord. Police quickly shot this down because the, the weight of a person's body and you put it around a ceiling fan, that ceiling fan is going to come ripped right out of the wall. They would also interview Nancy's daughters, and they found out through that that the steamer trunk that, you know, the body was found in, they said, yep, that's, that's her steamer trunk. She bought that. And then they also found out that she was using her own daughter's names and information to get loans and stuff. And when the daughters saw a picture of that trunk, they knew it was hers because of that, the nail polish that was seen on it. They said, yeah, that's definitely hers. So they built this humongous case against Nancy. They brought in all of her previous victims that she defrauded. They brought in many people to show the type of character she had, which was horrible. And nobody believed that Jack killed himself. It was more than obvious they were able to establish that she killed him because she was afraid that Jack was going to spill the beans to her next target, Eric Siegel. And so she began to slowly murder him by uh, poisoning him by starving him to a point where she was then able to kill him and physically move his body around. So she was charged with 21 different counts. Murder, various fraud charges, identity theft, tampering with evidence, and a jury found her guilty. She was 61 years old when she was sentenced, and she was sentenced to 33 years in prison, meaning she will be in her 90s when she could ever even think about being released meaning she will probably die in prison. It took decades for a family to get justice, only for the killer to get a slap on the wrist. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Holly Marie Andrews. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Holly Andrews was just 16 years old. Shortly before December of 1976, the 16-year-old was in a mental health institution, and that was for treatment for a drug habit. And she got to the other side of it. For Christmas of 1976, Holly was with her mom in Columbine, Colorado. On December 26, 1976, this was the day after Christmas, Holly would leave her mom's house to walk to her friend's house. But Holly never got to the friend's house. According to witnesses later, at somewhere around 5.30 p.m. that evening, Holly was observed hitchhiking. And this was along the intersection of Bellevue and Broadway in Englewood. And while Holly never made it to the friend's house, she also never got back home. She was expected to come back home the following morning. Again, this is 1976. This is before text messaging and all that and emails and stuff. So this wasn't, you know, out of the norm for someone to like not call the friend's house and say, you know, that their daughter's okay. So the following day, when she still hasn't arrived home and they find out she never made it to her friend's house, they report her missing. Initially, the police were like, well, she's a 16-year-old kid. She probably just ran away. They would soon find out that was definitely not the case. On December 27th, the following day, two skiers found the body of a young girl. She had been stabbed to death, and she was nude except for a pair of blue uh, knee-high socks. The coroner determined that this young woman had been stabbed at least six or seven times and she was sexually assaulted, and there was evidence that she was sexually assaulted after she was dead. They would quickly identify the body as 16-year-old Holly Andrews. They investigated the case, but they really didn't have much evidence. Again, in 1976, they didn't really have the technology we have now, and so really they had to rely on witness statements and stuff like that, but they weren't really getting anywhere with it. And then in 1983, the sentient overcooked potato Henry Lee Lucas confessed to the murder. 
This guy confessed, as we've talked about many times in other videos I've made, he has confessed to hundreds and hundreds of murders. He was nicknamed the Confession Killer. There's a whole Netflix documentary about him. He told the police that he had raped and stabbed a young girl and then threw her body off the side of the road. There were aspects of the case that he actually got correct. And so it, initially he was charged with Holly's murder. But they didn't have enough evidence to actually bring forth, you know, an actual case here. All they really had was his word. But once they began to unravel who he was, they were finding his story less and less credible. I mean, the, the stuff he talked about in terms of the body would have been very easy to have just come up with. And also he could have read it in a newspaper. And then when science finally caught up, they were able to uh, get DNA from the evidence from Holly's case. And they tried to match it up with his. Wasn't a match. There was uh, male bodily fluid found with her. And it was not his. So he was eventually ruled out. And then the case goes cold for decades. No tips, no leads. The DNA isn't matching anyone already in the database for quite some time. Until 2008. They resubmit the DNA, and this time it does hit someone. A man named Ricky Harnish. At the time of, of this happening, he was 52 years old. He was a known meth addict who had been in and out of jail. And here's where it gets really shitty. He would confess that he was the one responsible for killing her. He told in court uh, basically what happened. It was a random chance encounter. He kidnapped her, brought her to a secluded location where he thrust a knife into her chest and he actually told the family what her last words were as she took her last breath. Her final words on this earth were, you killed me. And then he raped her. For whatever fucking reason, the prosecutors offered this monster a plea deal that they would take sexual assault and kidnapping off the table if he pled guilty to second degree murder. And the judge accepted the plea deal and sentenced him to 10 to 24 years. Holly's family was not... <laughs> they were happy they got a resolution. They, they know who did this. But the, pro the prosecution had claimed that they put this deal basically in front of the family. And they told the public that the family accepted this deal. But the family said, no, we didn't. The family would say, we, we wanted them to leave kidnapping on the table for sure. Because that would guarantee him life in prison. But the prosecution took all of it out and they just said second degree murder. The prosecutors tried to ease the family's mind. Harnish was in very bad health. He was in declining health. He had uh, hepatitis C, he had diabetes. And so they told the family, he's probably not even gonna make it you know, to the end of his sentence. Well, that's not true either. Nine years into his sentence, he's released. He's a free man. Not only that, he is also not on any national sex offender registry at all. And he is living back in the community where the murder happened. Meaning that Holly's family could run into this guy at the store. They could see him walking down the street. And their loved one will no longer ever be able to do anything ever again. And this whole thing of like, well, he's in declining health and so blah, 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 blah. Let him suffer in prison then. He doesn't deserve to be out. He kidnapped, raped, and murdered a 16-year-old girl. Our, the, the whole, this whole justice system, it's just such horseshit. Holly deserved way better than that. And now her monster is out there living free as a bird. She would drop her son off at the bus stop and then no one would ever see her alive again. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Holly Grimm. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Holly Grimm was 41 years old and she was living in Lower McCungee Township in Pennsylvania. Holly was a very, very loving and devoted mother to a young boy. Her son was her entire life. She loved nothing more than spending time with him and doing things with him. Holly was also a racing enthusiast. She very much enjoyed NASCAR, and she had been a really big Dale Earnhardt fan. She was also an excellent bowler. She loved to uh, compete in bowling leagues. Holly was also working in the, I guess, the wood shop of Allen Organs. I guess they're a company that makes and, and manufactures uh, church organs, and I think she had been doing that for a while. Holly was supposed to come to work on November 22nd, 2013, but she was a no-show. 
Later on that day, Holly's mother would go to Holly's trailer and she discovered that Holly was in fact not home. However, Holly's trailer inside was in disarray. There had been coffee like spilled all over the place. There was an ashtray that had been thrown on the ground and all of its contents were all over the floor. But in the parking area was Holly's car, and in the home were Holly's cigarettes, her asthma medication, everything she would have needed to go about her day, all at home. So Holly is reported missing based on the fact that she didn't show up to work, her house is in disarray, something feels off. They would learn quickly through her son that Holly had dropped him off at the bus stop, which I guess was somewhat near the trailer park, and then she walked back into the trailer park and then back into her home and then no one ever saw her ever again. Once police got this case, they pretty quickly established a person of interest. This was a co-worker of Holly's, a man named Michael Horvath. The reason why he came up on their radar pretty quickly is, the, the first reason, is because he was also a no-show to work that morning when he was scheduled to work. He would end up calling work that day a little bit later on past his shift time to say he was running late because he had a tire issue. But he was late by a long time. When they interviewed people at their employer, they discovered that Michael had been stalking Holly. Michael had this obsession with her, even though he himself was married. So police would interview him and he... Ugh. He seemed to be pretty much cooperative for the most part, but the police had no actual scene of a, of a crime scene. Like there was no signs of any actual forced entry into her home. There wasn't any blood in her home. There were those indications that a struggle may have taken place, but that wasn't enough to just say, oh, okay, he did something to her. And unfortunately, they just didn't have anything. Most importantly, they didn't have Holly. And then in August of 2015, Michael Horvath's wife, Kathy, would come forward to police. So Kathy talks to police and says that she suspects that Michael is having an affair with a woman named Nicole, something that was actually eventually verified. I guess he met her through some sort of dating website. And she also tells them that Michael, around the time that Holly had disappeared, he had been going to his, I guess their other property, which was about 300 miles away from where Holly vanished. And he would go there typically to dispose of his, I guess, any of the wild game entrails that he caught, you know, during hunting. And they're actually able to obtain a warrant to search that property. And this is that property there. They searched this property for quite some time. They have police combing it from top to bottom inside the house. They're pulling all sorts of evidence from it. They have excavation teams. They're working all through the night. And eventually, they find something. In the backyard of Michael Horvath's home, they find skeletal remains. Partial remains. They found human teeth. They found vertebrae. They found a skull fragment, which looked like it had a bullet hole in it. And there was also this big burn pit where they discovered a, uh, a tiny bone fragment. They take all of those bone fragments, and they are able, through DNA testing, to confirm that those were the remains of 41-year-old Holly Grimm. She had been murdered. And it was more than obvious that Michael Horvath tried to dispose of her body by cutting her up and trying to burn her remains. But, you know, thankfully, he did not do a very good job. So Michael Horvath was arrested and he was charged with her murder. At his trial, which was delayed several times due to the COVID pandemic, they were also able to establish that he had, his cell phone had been in the area where Holly was last seen. The whole time he's denying that, that he did anything to her, but her body was found on his property. His own defense team and him would actually throw his wife, Kathy, under the bus. They actually tried to blame the murder possibly on her, saying that his wife was jealous of the fact that he had been stalking uh, Holly. And so maybe she did something. But they investigated that angle and all roads led back to Michael. Michael was found guilty on all charges, murder, kidnapping, tampering with evidence, abuse of a corpse, and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. And Holly and her family got the justice they rightfully deserved. Ranking scary movie villains in the likelihood of me being able to outrun them in a chase. So starting with... I just realized I'm really fat. I can't outrun any of them. 
true crime docuseries that I would like to recommend. No, it's not a paid sponsorship. So this show, Into the Fire, The Lost Daughter, is on Netflix. It's only two episodes long, and it is fantastic. It's very uh, compelling, and it's a case that I had never heard of before. So just kind of like a, an overall synopsis here. I won't, like, spoil anything. I know it's a true story, so you can always look it up, but I know people like to watch these things with, like, a fresh eye and not, be, not know what happens. But in March of 1989, a 14-year-old girl named Andrea Bowman went missing. And she went missing from Michigan. And at one point, a, uh, a body of a young female is found. And they're trying to find out if that body belonged to Andrea Bowman. But her family that she was reported missing from was not her biological family. So they had to track down her biological mom. And her mom is here, Kathy. Kathy gave up Andrea um, when she was 17 years old. She got pregnant really young. She had a very rough upbringing. And so she had to give up the baby for adoption before the baby was even a year old. She did what she felt was the right thing to do at that time. And so eventually she's tracked down by police just to get her DNA to see if it's a match to this body they found. Which then sends her on this whole journey to find her missing, you know, biological daughter. And it leads her down this path where she gets, you know, involved with armchair detectives, internet sleuths. And she even finds um, a woman who was abducted when the woman was a lot younger, when she was just six years old, that she believes is linked to the disappearance of Andrea Bowman. And there's just like a lot of twists and turns in this case. It's just a really compelling story. But like the biggest takeaway for me of, of all was Kathy, her biological mom. She, this is an she is a fucking amazing woman like if you watch this show she is she is such a a fierce force to be reckoned with type person you you see like a woman who is uh, one side trying to find her missing daughter and also you see like in her like this regret of having to give her baby up for adoption and it led to you know eventually this horrible thing happening which obviously is not at all her fault, you know, obviously you can never predict this kind of thing happening when you give a baby up for adoption, but she becomes like this incredible like wrecking ball trying to get to the bottom of what happened to her daughter. And she really ends up being more motherly than her adopted parents. Like I, I just, I absolutely loved her. But I, you know, I will tell you that this does become a solved case. So there isn't like any kind of, you're not left hanging in the end. But for me, I think it's just that like, you know, Kathy makes this such a powerful story. And it's just, it's definitely worth a watch. So you should definitely check this out if you have Netflix. Another day and just another disgusting injustice. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Javion McGee. Viewer discretion is advised. So I want to start this video by saying that I was tagged in this creator's video. This is her page here, um, and then she has that video pinned right there. She is the cousin to 21-year-old Javion McGee. Javion was just a couple of weeks away from turning 22. In June of 2024, so just really a few months ago, Javion got his CDL, and so he became a truck driver. He was living in the Chicago, Illinois area, but obviously as a truck driver, you're going to be driving all over the place. And so this would take him through the Henderson, North Carolina area. I don't know the precise date when this occurred. Javion McGee's family would be notified that he was found deceased uh, near Henderson, North Carolina. The 21-year-old man was found hanging from a tree behind a truck stop. And the police just pretty much immediately would rule this a suicide. According to his family, the police have claimed that he walked into a local Walmart there in Henderson and purchased the rope. But to my understanding, they have not proven that yet. And his family, understandably, doesn't believe it. This is a young black man who is found hanging from a tree. This is a lynching. He was literally just driving through Henderson, North Carolina to drop off a delivery. He just got his CDL. Literally none of it makes sense as to why he would just randomly do this in a random place. Obviously, no police department, sheriff's department, no city is going to want to admit that someone lynched someone in their city. 
So covering this type of thing up and just saying, oh, he did it to himself, well, that'll just wipe their hands clean of it. But that isn't justice. The coroner's office was giving Javion's mother the runaround about going there to identify his body. First, they told her, well, you can't come here because COVID. But then like the next day they say, okay, you can come here, but we need to get permission from Javion's father. What? Which by the way, he gave permission. She then also asks, in the meantime, can you please, you know, forward me or send me the photos of him? And they say, yes, we can do that. But then they turn around and say, you know what? You shouldn't really see these photos. Like all of it screams obvious cover up. Henderson, North Carolina doesn't want to be known as a place where young black men are lynched. So of course, just victim blame. Blame it on him. He did it. You know, just easy peasy. A proper investigation should be done. Javion McGee's name should be all over the news. It isn't. It's literally nowhere. I, can, I can't even find a single published story about it. I can only get information from, you know, TikTok videos. That's not how this should be done. Also, his phone and wallet are missing, by the way. Yeah, that's totally normal. So the police there in North Carolina, they need to be urged. They need to be pushed into investigating that. At the very least, just investigate this. And they can't hide from it if everybody knows about it. And that's why we do this stuff, right? This is what it's, this is what it's for. Can I sit here on my end and say absolutely he didn't do it to himself? No, of course I can't say that. But none of it adds up. None of it makes sense. The police behavior is ridiculous. Something extremely suspicious and very fishy is going on there. This young man deserves, at the very least, he deserves attention and he deserves people caring about him. And honestly, it sounds like he needs justice. So I would encourage you, especially to go to her page and absolutely keep on commenting on her video. Every time you see a video on this case, just, you know, keep pushing it, repost it, share it. Pressure the police until it's uncomfortable for them. Pressure them into actually doing something about this. And hopefully one day, very, very soon, Javion McGee will get the justice he very rightfully deserves. A man is found shot to death in his bedroom. Was it suicide or was it murder? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Jeffrey Digman. Viewer discretion is advised. Ever since he was about 10 years old, Jeffrey Digman dreamed about becoming a Marine. And that dream became a reality when he was about 28 years old. He was initially based in San Diego, California, where he bought a house with a uh, fellow Marine. But in November of 1988, he was actually transferred to Puerto Rico, something he was not initially happy about doing, but he did it. After a couple of months of being there, he met uh, Lucy Garcia and they became a couple and he was happy. He was content with this move. Sometime after Christmas in 1988, he would travel back to San Diego to visit and he was going to be there for about two weeks. He was scheduled to fly back to Puerto Rico on January 22nd, 1989. That actually just so happened to be Super Bowl Sunday. Well, during halftime, the neighbor next door to uh, Jeffrey's house said he actually saw Jeffrey pull into the driveway and walk into the house and everything seemed fine. A few hours later, the neighbor and another person in the house heard what sounded like a car backfiring, but they didn't really think much of it. Now, Jeffrey lived in that house with a roommate, but his roommate was out of town. He had been in Las Vegas, but was planning on coming back that day. So he arrives back at the house sometime around 10 or 10.30 p.m. with his girlfriend. He approaches the house and sees that Jeffrey's car is still there, but he said that can't possibly be because Jeffrey was scheduled to be on the flight. So the roommate goes to the neighbor, and then the neighbor and the other occupant of that house, they all enter their home together. Obviously, I have to cover this up because this is the actual photo. But to their horror, they find Jeffrey in his bedroom, lying on the bed, halfway on the bed, shot to death. He was sitting in a pool of blood. The police seemed to be pretty convinced that this was a suicide from the get-go, and the coroner would basically confirm their suspicions. Jeffrey had been shot through his right temple. The bullet, I believe, ended up somewhere in the ceiling behind the bed. They also tested his hands for gunshot residue. His right hand tested positive for GSR. Jeffrey's mom thought that was kind of strange because Jeffrey was left-handed, and, you know, the assumption is if you're going to be using your left hand, you put it up to the left side of your head. 
not necessarily to the right side of your head. It doesn't mean he couldn't have used his right hand though. But I think the idea here is that it's like instinct that we use our dominant hand without really thinking about it. And so that's kind of what made them suspicious of all this, which I, you know, I understand. Jeffrey's blood alcohol level was, I guess, extremely high. It was at 0.24, three times the legal limit for intoxication. And without really knowing exactly why, there was no suicide note left behind. They just said this was a suicide and called it a day. But the family wasn't wasn't having it. This is an actual recreation of Jeffrey's bedroom. So this is in his his childhood home that his parents got all the furniture and put it into his old childhood bedroom. And they put it in the exact same positions it was in the night of Jeffrey's death. They had a uh, private investigator uh, look into this. And if you can see here, this string uh, is lined up with the trajectory of the bullet. Now, Jeffrey was found here on the bed, and you can see the string at this angle. It just doesn't make sense for him to be sitting on the bed and to have pulled the trigger. But he could have been standing up, possibly. Except, and this is his dad, putting his head at the angle that the bullet would have had to travel. He would have had to basically be in this position, hanging off the bed. And because of, I guess, how the bullet entered, the gun would have had to have been turned upside down. And based on this positioning, Jeffrey would have had to have fallen on the ground not fallen backwards, and that's not where the momentum would have taken him. But that's exactly how he was found, lying on his back, halfway on the bed. Other things to note that they picked up, this was a recreation TikTok, calm down. There was a trail of blood going down from his ear. Well, physics tells them that in order for that to have occurred, he would have had to have been upright for a few seconds after the gunshot. They also, again, recreation, they also found a blood smear on the bed in a different position, and they don't know where that came from. In 1991, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology would re-examine the autopsy notes, and they actually changed his death from suicide to undetermined. There were some additional bruisings they found on his body after they exhumed his body at the request of his parents, but they said those injuries were not really necessarily tied to his death. But there was enough evidence to say that this was possibly not a suicide. But what would be the motive? Well, according to his mom, at one point when they had gone to his house, I guess they had found, his parents had found some documents in his dresser. And those documents were like drug testing documents. He had been working with the San Diego Marine Drug Testing Unit. But after his death, they looked, they could not find those documents anywhere in the house. And according to his mother, and I think his roommates, Jeffrey had this green book, which I guess a lot of Marines had that had all of their like private notes in it. Well, when they received that notebook back, when the parents got it, there were pages literally ripped out of it, indicating there was something in them that no one else was gonna be allowed to see. His parents believe that this has something to do with the drug testing unit, that he was likely going to possibly expose something like drug smuggling from Puerto Rico to San Diego, and he was killed because of his knowledge, or he was killed because he was going to come forward. But even as of now, that has never been proven, and his death is still ruled undetermined. It doesn't make sense based on the trajectory of the bullet that he did it to himself. Not to say that it's impossible, but it's just very odd and suspicious. Normally, this is where I would tell you that if you have information, you can contact the appropriate authorities, uh, such as the Riverside County Sheriff's Department. They might be more willing to listen. But the Naval Investigative Service, if this was possibly a cover-up, I don't think they're going to want to listen to you. But it is still worth the try if you have information to give them that info and see what can come from it. Because if he was murdered, Jeffrey deserves justice. So here's an interesting little bit of true crime news. I didn't even know this was even in the works. But there is going to be a John Bonet Ramsey limited series coming. And they announced earlier today who is starring as John Bonet's parents. Melissa McCarthy has been cast as Patsy Ramsey. And Clive Owen has been cast as John Ramsey. I don't believe they have cast uh, John Bonet or anyone else yet. It's going to be a Paramount Plus limited series, but I, that, I just, the, the casting news caught me kind of a little bit by surprise. I was, Melissa McCarthy is, I love her, but I just, I never imagined her in this kind of role. I mean, she is an Oscar nominee, so there is that. Has she ever done like a, like a serious, serious role before? And Clive Owen is John Ramsey? Sure. I haven't really heard much from uh, Clive Owen these days. Actually, no, he was just in that one miniseries, The Murder at the End of the World. I didn't really like that one very much. But yeah, I just thought that was interesting. So yeah, John Bonet Ramsey limited series is coming to Paramount Plus. And as of now, the parents have been cast. I'm very curious to see who else gets cast in this. So I saw this.
sorry, I got lost for a second. <clears throat> I saw this Game of Thrones joke somewhere and I wanted to share it with you. Why did Jon Snow enter the Apple store? For the watch. Okay, that's all. <laughs> Bye. 46 murder suspects and no arrests. Was this truly the man who deserved to die? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Ken McElroy. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Ken McElroy was a 47-year-old man, and he lived here in the town of Skidmore, Missouri. And Ken, well, he was well known. From a very early age, Ken became a bully to everybody. He would bully, harass, and steal from his classmates. He would go around shoplifting from all of the stores. By the age of 13, he was considered the town bully of Skidmore. Everybody knew him, and everybody hated him. And anyone who confronted him, well, he would try to intimidate. As he got older, the entire community began to fear him, because he never really seemed to get in any kind of trouble. Over the course of his adult life, he would be accused of more than two dozen different felonies. He committed assaults, child molestation, statutory rape, arson, animal cruelty, hog and cattle rustling, and burglary, just to name a few. He also shot a person before, the person did not die, but he didn't get in trouble for that either. Ken had an attorney that would basically get him out of everything. Some said that his attorney worked for the mob. And every time someone tried to press charges against him or accuse him of something, he would be going around and intimidating those people, threatening them, scaring them into not charging him with anything. Ken also had a wife at the time of this case. She was the last of his many different wives. He met Trina McLeod when she was just 12 years old and he was already on his second wife and he became romantically involved with her. And to prevent from being charged with statutory rape against her, he would divorce his wife and marry her. Her parents were basically bullied into allowing this child to marry that man. Ken did father many children with multiple different women, including with Trina. He actually impregnated Trina when she was 14 years old. And this whole ploy of marrying her was to get out of being charged with anything, as she would be the only actual witness to those crimes. When Trina had their first child, she would flee the house and try to escape with her parents, or move back in with them. But Ken found her and forced her back to his home. Then, after he brought her back to his home, he went back to Trina's parents' house, burned the house down, and shot their dog. All while still never getting in any kind of trouble. But then he finally met his downfall. A 71-year-old local grocer there in Skidmore, Ernest Bo Bowenkamp. Bo would accuse one of Ken's daughters of shoplifting. Sometime after that, Ken would go to Bo at his store and he shot him through the neck with a shotgun. Thankfully and miraculously, Bo survives. Ken is actually arrested and charged with attempted murder. Leading up to the trial, Bo and his family were terrified to sleep. They were terrified to go anywhere because this man was finding a way to intimidate them and scare the living shit out of them. Unbelievably, he would be convicted but not of attempted murder, but instead for second degree assault. He was sentenced to two years in prison for this. However, he would appeal. And this, by the way, was after it's believed he bullied the previous DA into leaving and quitting his job, which then brought in a new DA who had absolutely no experience. But because he appealed the, the sentence, he was let out on bond. And while he was out on bond, he would go to the local bar armed with a rifle. Again, trying to scare and intimidate people. The town finally had enough. The law was doing nothing about this man. So about 60 people would congregate to City Hall and they would have a meeting. At this meeting, they found out that Ken was at the bar. So roughly 46 of these people will go to the location of the bar, which is here, and they waited for Ken to leave. Trina was actually sitting in the passenger side of his truck. The 46 people then surrounded the truck as Ken tried to get inside of it. They confronted him, arguments broke out, and then gunshots. Ken McElroy had been shot twice by two different guns. Nobody called an ambulance, nobody called police. 46 people surrounded him and watched Ken McElroy die. 
And by the time an ambulance does finally get notified, he's already dead. And not one of the people there will admit or say anything about who actually fired the fatal shots. Trina said she thinks she saw who may have done it, but 46 other people would say, no, she didn't. This included the town sheriff, by the way. Over 40 witnesses would also be 40 suspects. But when they are questioned, not one person gives in. Nobody will talk. Nobody will say a single word about who actually killed him. And quite frankly, nobody cared. He was reckless. He was violent. He had shot two people, committed statutory rape, child molestation. He married a child. He assaulted people, committed several burglaries. Nobody was doing anything about it. So the town decided, we're doing something about it. And even to this very day in 2024, nobody has ever come forward. No charges have ever been pressed. Nobody has ever been indicted. The townspeople of Skidmore, Missouri, they took the law into their own hands and they killed the man that some say deserved to die. A man would be convicted of a murder based solely on bite mark evidence. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Kim and Kona. Viewer discretion is advised. Kim and Kona was a 36-year-old recently divorced mother, and she lived in Phoenix, Arizona. She was trying to get back on her feet after her divorce, and she was just trying to earn an income to support her kid. She did so working here at the CBS restaurant and lounge as a bartender. On the night of December 28th, 1991, Kim was going to be the closing uh, bartender, but she never got home. The following morning, when the bar's manager came in around 8 o'clock, he walked into the women's restroom and he found a horror scene. Kim and Kona was partially clothed and she had been murdered in the bathroom. Kim had been stabbed multiple times and she had been sexually violated with a wooden doorstop. This was pure brutality. She suffered greatly. They would find bite marks on Kim's left breast and on her throat. They also collected a bunch of fingerprints. They had a shoe impression from a Converse sneaker in the kitchen. Kim had an address book that was still in her purse, and one of the numbers that was in it was for a man named Ray Crone, a man who was rumored to be involved romantically with Kim. But it turns out that was actually not the case at all. He was a local postman who, I guess they were just friends. Police would question him because they just wanted to know if he knew anything. He said that he had an alibi. He was watching a, a, a sporting event that night, which was confirmed. But police noticed that he had kind of a snaggle tooth. And the bite mark that was found on her body had like a jagged tooth impression, meaning it came from someone possibly with a snaggle tooth. So they would take his dental impression, I shit you not, on a styrofoam plate. They would then match it up and line it up with the bite mark uh, wounds. And they said, lo and behold, it's a match. However, the shoe impression did not match his, nor anyone else who worked there. They found no Converse sneakers in his home. Of all the fingerprints they found, not a single one of them matched Ray Crone. But they didn't seem to care. They arrested him and charged him with the murder based solely on the bite mark wounds. They didn't know what his motive was. It wasn't robbery because her purse was left behind and all the money was left behind in the register. They Maybe she scorned his advances and that made him mad. Great, except he wasn't at the crime scene. He had an alibi confirmed by a person. The shoe impression, the fingerprints. There was also DNA found and at that time, and I believe it was like a, a blood type match, but this was before we could do more specific DNA testing. But it was presented to the jury, the jury bought it, and he was found guilty of the murder and he was sentenced to death. In 1996, he actually is awarded a new trial because there was a, an issue with the judge in the previous trial. But once again, they present the bite mark evidence and pretty much nothing else, and the jury finds him guilty again. But in 2002, there was a new court ruling that said that any convicted person, they are able, they have the right to conduct testing on evidence from their case. So his attorneys, they would bring forth this DNA testing. And this was DNA found with Kim, like it was on her body. It came from her killer. It did not match Ray Crone at all, but it did match someone who was already in their system. A man named Kenneth Phillips. He had actually been sent to prison about a month after the murder of Kim. He, at the time, lived less than 600 yards away from the bar. Fingerprints found at the crime scene matched his. 
Hair samples left at the crime scene matched his. The shoe impression left behind was the same size that he wore. When police would question him about it, he said, oh, I think I was at the bar that night, but I don't remember what happened. But he did tell police that he remembers he was there and he got really angry because the bartender cut him off. So not only do they have physical evidence, but now they have by his own admission that he was in that bar and there was possibly a motive there. In 2002, Ray Crone was released from prison, all charges dropped, and he's basically found innocent. In 2006, Kenneth Phillips pleads guilty to the murder and is sentenced to 53 years in prison. The bite mark thing? It was just done by someone who was really not good at their job. I cannot stand when people are convicted based on this type of thing. It's infuriating. If the Earth is flat, do the moon and all other planets are flat? <laughs> No, they are doesn't. <laughs> Let me get this straight. Aren't them was it? <laughs> I think my sense of humor is broken because I just find everything hilarious. Is it is it because I'm old? It didn't ain't. <laughs> me fail English. That's impossible. In it though, should have taught. They ain't did that. See what had happened was them got they took and <laughs> we from then ain't round. <laughs> it's an undercover flat earther. They only give their smartest people that job. If there hasn't <laughs> That they're good or smokes is awesome. Me's be understooding it all. Gibberish be mine firstest language. Wasn't this that, um, who is what? <laughs> they ain't not here no more. Pretty sure this made me have an aneurysm. Yeah, I think I died. Are the moon and all not do the moon and all? Dumb, you are. Thank you. Is they be? I am think they isn't. Don't got none. Yes, like Pink Floyd's album, <laughs> Flat Side of the Moon. <laughs> them are not there i heard the flat earth society is over a million members now. <laughs> all around the world <laughs> why 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 do i find this this stupid shit so funny anyway you're welcome <laughs> a young college student is found bludgeoned to death in a field Many years later, someone that she had dated would solve her murder. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Laura Salmon. Viewer discretion is advised. Laura was born on October 6, 1965. And at the time of this case, she was 18 years old. Laura was attending uh, Middle Tennessee State University in Tennessee. And she was working at a local Kroger store. Laura seemed to be really well liked, really friendly. She had a big group of friends. And she was in a relationship with this man here, David Kyle Gilly, who would go by Kyle. Kyle was a very jealous boyfriend. And he was also a violent one. He had been violent with Laura on a couple of occasions, including one time where he knocked out her front teeth. He also had been in other abusive relationships. And like I said, Laura had a big group of friends. Friends that absolutely adored her. One of her friends was this guy here, a man named Dan Goodwin. About four days prior to this case occurring, he actually had gone on like a, I guess a social date with Laura. They went to go see a movie. They had a good time. And that was basically the last time that he would see her. On May 31st, 1984, a local farmer had been walking through this field when he found the body of a young woman. She was covered in blood and she had been surrounded by a couple of rocks. The rocks had blood on them. Draped over her body were two pairs of jeans. One of them was confirmed to be hers. The other pair was way too big for her. And it was obvious that these were men's jeans. There appeared to be blood spatter on the jeans and also they found some male bodily fluid. The body would soon be identified as 18 year old Laura Salmon. Laura had been bludgeoned to death. And these are all the rocks that were found near her that were likely used in her murder. So they went to look into where she was on that day. They discovered that she actually left the, her job at the Kroger around 1 p.m. They confirmed that she was definitely there. She was seen leaving. She was supposed to head to a meeting at Middle Tennessee University. And then after that, she was supposed to go to her grandmother's house to go swimming. She never made it to her grandma's house. And they also found out she never made it to the university. Sometime later, her vehicle was found uh, pretty close to where the store was, the grocery store. And inside the car, it was pretty clean. There wasn't any like fingerprints, no blood. They did find a single strand of hair that was not hers, but that was it. 
There was some dirt and mud caked into the wheels that I believe was similar to the, the dirt and mud that was found kind of near where her body was. Police would interview several witnesses and friends, and there were people who placed Laura at a local uh, bar just the night prior, and that Laura was dancing with a man that no one recognized. But then people would find out that that man was actually someone that was friends with Laura, and that person, that guy was ruled out. The first person they genuinely interviewed was her boyfriend, Kyle Gilly. He said he had an alibi. He was with a family member. The family member confirmed. And despite the police finding out that he was abusive towards her, that they had a very tumultuous relationship, that one family member confirming he was there was all they needed. And they ruled him out, which was not something that made Laura's family very happy. But then a woman in Nashville, Tennessee would come forward to say that she had been sexually assaulted by a man. And according to her, that man said, you need to cooperate with me or you're going to end up like Laura Salmon. Well, this man also attended the same university Laura did. And when they took a sample of his hair, it actually was microscopically similar to the hair found in her car. However, the men's jeans they found on top of her body, there's no way it fit him. He was determined to be way too small to wear these jeans. And so he was ruled out. And then Laura's case goes cold. And if you remember, I mentioned this guy here, Dan Goodwin. He had gone on a date with Laura just four days prior to her murder. Well, Dan would become a news reporter, but then eventually he became a cop. He had promised Laura's mom, you know, I'm going to solve her murder. I'm going to get to the end of this. And he worked his way up the ladder and he became a homicide detective. Now, because he had a, a relationship with Laura, they actually asked him to surrender his DNA, which he did very willingly. They ran it. It was not his DNA found on the genes. And once he is cleared, he begins to work. They found out about another man named David, and I guess David's son, uh, sometime around the year 2000, would say that his dad, David, uh, confessed to killing Laura, and that he dumped her body in that Lover's Lane area where she was found. So they collect his DNA, and they confirm that it was not his. Now, I do want to point out that initially, when the coroner examined her body, they determined that she was actually not sexually assaulted. And I guess they determined that she actually had consensual sex probably 24 to 48 hours prior to her body being found. But the male bodily fluid they found on her jeans would have had to have been left by whoever killed her because it was on top of the blood on the jeans. Also, the jeans were found on her deceased body. So Dan Goodwin basically has to start from scratch because all the suspects they've had so far have been cleared. But then he finds out that there was an eyewitness that was interviewed who actually went to police and stated that they saw someone, a man, driving Laura's car, and she recognized the man immediately. It was Kyle Gilly, and he was driving the vehicle after Laura would have been dead. But police back then, because he had this alibi, they disregarded her story and moved on. So by 2000, they tracked Kyle Gilly down to Florida where he had already faced criminal charges for sexual battery, attempted burglary, aggravated assault, resisting arrest. And when they interviewed him, he denied having anything to do with Laura's murder. However, he willingly gave a DNA sample. And that was the end for him. The DNA was a 100% match. It was his semen found on her genes. Laura's mom told police that she always told them that it was Kyle who did it. She, she was insisting it from the moment it happened. Given the abusive relationship, the jealousy, the anger, she always knew it was him. And why police disregarded that eyewitness person stating they saw him in Laura's car after she was dead, I have no idea why they disregarded that. But thankfully, Dan Goodwin kept his promise to Laura's mom. Kyle Gilly was then arrested and charged with her murder. They presented the DNA, the witness, not to mention all the character witnesses who described who this man was back then. The prosecution laid out their case that Kyle uh, had witnessed Laura the night prior dancing with another man. And with him being jealous, this made him very mad. Then the following afternoon, they were supposed to meet up and go swimming. But first they went to that lover's lane area where she was eventually found. They got into an argument and he took a rock that was nearby while he was on his knees and he bludgeoned her over the head several times. He then realized that her blood was on his jeans, so he took them off and put them over her body. I don't know if they were already engaging in a sexual act and that's why her jeans were already off. And she also had her underwear clasped in her hand. So I don't know if 
they were already involved in doing something, or if he did that on purpose to pose her like that to make it look like a sexual assault. I'm not sure. It took close to 20 years to finally get to this resolution, but Kyle Gilley was found guilty of the murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. I believe he has an option for parole, but he is still rotting in a prison cell to this day. What's a TV show you love but think that most people haven't even heard of? This one is mine. It's a little show called Eureka. Have you guys heard of this show before? Unbelievably, this was a show on the Sci-Fi Network. As a matter of fact, two of my top 10 favorite television shows of all time were on the Sci-Fi Network, which is crazy because they make the stupidest movies. So Eureka and the Battlestar Galactica reboot. But this show, which you can actually see on, I'm re-watching it right now on Amazon Prime, and it's free on there if you have Prime. But it's about this town called Eureka, which is in, I think it's in Oregon. And this town is home to the most brilliant minds in the world. Brilliant scientists, mathematicians, etc. And basically they are there to invent and innovate and sometimes uh, create weapons for the, the military. And basically everyone in this town, almost everyone, is highly intelligent people. Um, except for <laughs> the town's sheriff who got to Eureka simply by accident. But he ends up becoming like the sheriff of Eureka and he's kind of like this like bumbling like everyman type person who doesn't have the level of intelligence as the rest of the people there. But every episode is like some kind of science experiment they've done has gone horribly wrong and it's creating havoc in the town or, or it's going to be catastrophic to the country or the world. And then so Sheriff Jack Carter is uh, constantly trying to stop these things from happening. And it's definitely a, uh, I would call it a comedy, like a sci-fi comedy, but it's not like a laugh every minute type comedy, you know, thing. It's a quirky show. It's very quirky. It's just so, I don't know, it's just so wholesome <laughs> in a weird way. It's just a lot of fun. It's definitely like um, like a comfort food type TV show. It's just, it's entertaining. It's, I don't know, it's just, ugh. But yeah, if you've never seen it, you can. Uh, it's only a bit, it was only on for five seasons. And I think it's it's like 70 something episodes long. Kind of similar to Battlestar Galactica, which is another fracking brilliant show if you've never seen it. Anyway, what's yours? <laughs> His idea of revenge, do not say he looks like me with glasses. His idea of revenge was rape and mass murder. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Luna family. Viewer discretion is advised. On September 15th, 1993, Albert Luna Jr. would enter his family home in Phoenix, Arizona. He called out their names, but nobody responded. When he walked just a few more feet inside the house, he found his family. They had been brutally murdered. His 40-year-old mother, Patricia, his 46-year-old father, Albert, his 17-year-old sister, Rochelle, and his 5-year-old brother, Damien. They had all been shot and stabbed multiple times. He also noticed that there was a pizza box on top of the stove with the burners on and the smell of gasoline was permeating through the house. Whoever had killed his family had tried to set the house on fire, but failed. Obviously, they wanted to do that to cover up their crime. Albert Jr. had some ideas who may have done this, but police, regardless, were actually pretty quick to find out who did. It was a friend slash co-worker of Albert Luna Jr., that man was Richard Jerf. Richard Jerf had told his girlfriend that he killed the family. And so his girlfriend did the right thing and called police. So he was promptly arrested. The arrest happened on September 18th, 1993. So what happened and why did he do it? Well, Richard says that his now former friend, Albert Luna Jr., he believes stole from Richard. I guess rewinding back to January of 1993, Richard's home was burglarized and there was a VCR stolen, a TV, stereo equipment, and even an AK-47 was stolen. And he believed that Albert Luna Jr. was the person to do it. I'm going to tell you right now, it's true. Albert Luna would later admit that he was the one to burglarize his home. But Richard Jerf decided, well, you stole from me, so I guess I'm going to murder your entire family. On September 14th, 1993, Richard approached the house with a thing of flowers and he was posing as a flower delivery guy. 
Once the door was opened, he forced a 9mm handgun in the face of the person who opened the door. He then forced Patricia to take a bunch of items from their home and load them into Richard's car, because Richard was now burglarizing the home, including taking back some of the items that were stolen from him. At that time, it was just Patricia and five-year-old Damien in the house. He then ties both of them to a chair. And then for the next seven hours, he tortures this family. 17-year-old Rochelle comes home from school. He immediately takes her into a bedroom where he ties her up and then he rapes her. And then he kills her. Then Albert Luna Sr. came home from work. Richard snuck up behind him and basically forced him into the bedroom with a gun. And then he handcuffed Albert Luna Sr. to the bed. He then took a baseball bat and then continued to repeatedly beat Albert Luna Sr. until he thought he was dead. He then uncuffed him from the bed. But Albert was not dead. He grabbed a knife from Richard and stabbed Richard, I think, once or twice. But then using the 9mm Beretta he brought with him, he fired several rounds into Albert Sr. Then he went to Patricia and the five-year-old boy. According to Richard, he tried several different methods, painful methods, of torturing the two of them to kill them. But they weren't dying from these. Like, he had tried stabbing them, they weren't dying. Again, to a five-year-old child. But he got frustrated when they weren't dying, and so he took the gun and he shot both of them into in their heads, killing both of them. Albert Jr., who was not at the home and never came home that day, came home the following day and found his family. So Richard Jerf essentially became his own lawyer. He wanted to represent himself. And he did so so that he could easily just plead guilty to the murders. And so he right then and there in court confessed to killing all of them, the reason why he did it, how he did it, and he just coldly told everyone the story. He was quoted as saying, it was all my fault. All my fault. He said, I'm not crazy. I don't hear voices in my head. I wasn't on drugs. He said that he didn't have a terrible childhood and that he just did what he did. He said that something took over him. He's like, not a possession or anything. He just he doesn't know what it was, but something took over him. And he just completely lost control. And again, he said, it wasn't drugs. It was just me. He says he wished that someone had gone with him that day to talk him out of it. Richard Jerf was sentenced to not one, but four death sentences. And he said, quote, doesn't bother me. They can only kill me once. He continually tried to appeal his death sentences, but he has lost every single appeal. Richard Jerf is still currently on death row here in Arizona. It's where I live. And just waiting until they finally kill him. And honestly, good riddance. He would wear this terrifying mask while he murdered his victims. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Markle family. Viewer discretion is advised. John Lawrence Markle was born in 1941, and he had a very famous mother. His mother was an Oscar-winning actress named Mercedes McCambridge. She won the 1949 Best Supporting Actress Oscar for the movie All the King's Men. Many, many years later, she would also be the voice of the demon in The Exorcist. She gave John a relatively normal upbringing. He was considered to be a very brilliant young man growing up through school. By 1973, he earned a PhD. A few years before that, in 1968, he would marry Christina Mull, and then the two of them would eventually have two girls together. Eventually, the Markle family would relocate to Little Rock, Arkansas, and moved into this home here on Main Street. On November 16th, 1987, John's attorney would get a phone call sometime around 4 o'clock in the morning. The call sounded urgent, and he was trying to tell his lawyer, please come here to my house immediately. And then he hung up. The lawyer tried calling back multiple times, but John didn't answer, so the lawyer called police. Police arrive at the house at 4.17 a.m. Police entered the home, and just in front of his own desk laid the body of John Markle. He had been shot through both sides of his head. The guns were lying at each side of his body, but he was not the only one. His 45-year-old wife, Christina, and their two daughters, 13-year-old Amy and 9-year-old Suzanne, were also found shot to death in the house. Each of them had been shot multiple times. Lying next to John's body was this mask. There was blood on the mask, like spatter-type blood, which would indicate to police that the killer was wearing the mask when the shots were fired. But who fired the shots? Well, John Markle did. 
When John Markle called his attorney at four o'clock in the morning, he had already shot and killed his wife and his two daughters. It's then believed he removed the mask, doesn't really know why he was wearing it to begin with, if his plan was to die that night. He then takes two different guns, puts them to both sides of his head, and pulls the triggers. Well, why did he do it? Well, three days prior, he was fired from his job. And not for normal reasons like, you know, not showing up. He was caught embezzling money. He was working for Stevens Incorporated, which was like a futures trading type place. I'm not 100% sure what that is, but, but his employers caught on to this pretty significant embezzlement scheme and he was fired for it. And the murder-suicide was not a spur-of-the-moment thing. In the home, they found a handwritten note that John wrote to his mother, who knew nothing of any of this going on. They also found a handwritten suicide note. He actually timestamped that note to about a couple of hours before he called his attorney. They also discovered that John, just a few days prior, like the day after he got fired, he voided his previous will and then rewrote a will in just his handwriting. And in that will, it excluded his wife and kids because he knew they would be dead. John was always described as a family man, someone who loved his wife and his, his daughters. He always seemed to be well-respected, well-liked, but he was also doing bad things at work. And perhaps the idea of being caught and perhaps going to jail for all of this, maybe he did not want to be embarrassed by it, and maybe he didn't want his family to be embarrassed of him and have to live with that. Obviously, that's a very shitty reason to kill your family, especially your two children. But that's likely what his thought process was. But it didn't need to happen. John could have just simply manned up, paid for his mistakes. But instead, he made his wife and two daughters pay for his mistakes as well. A missing woman's daughter would be the catalyst for solving this case. Hello, True Crimeers. This is the case of Marlene Oaks. Viewer discretion is advised. Marlene Oaks and her family lived in the really tiny town of Verona, Kentucky. This is one of those towns with like one or two stoplights. And that was literally their town hall right there. Marlene Oaks, who was born on December 7th, 1954, was the mother to two children. She had a son named Donald and a daughter named Lalana. And she was married to this man here, the father of the two children, William Bill Major. Marlene and Bill did not exactly have the best marriage. As a matter of fact, Marlene was having a extramarital affair, but with the encouragement of Bill. She was dating this man, Glenn St. Hilaire. And Glenn actually lived on their property. He lived here in this trailer behind their property. There was also rumors that Bill himself was involved in an extramarital affair. Bill was also a horrible father. Completely unknown to him, Marlene kept a diary. And in that diary, it would later be discovered that she found out, or she witnessed, Bill sexually molesting their son, Donald. Which kind of tracks already, because in 1975, Bill Major was convicted of sexually molesting two other young boys. And he only served a short amount of time for that. Now, because Marlene had witnessed this attack, he basically threatened her, like, if you try to leave this relationship or tell anyone about what you saw, I'll kill you. Marlene eventually would claim in this diary that she convinced Bill Major to sign divorce papers, as long as she promised to never tell on Bill for what he had done to the kids. Marlene uh, thankfully told her sister about the abuse, and she also told Bill, if you take any of this back, if you don't agree to sign the divorce papers, I will tell your mother about what you've done. It, it was just a really horrific situation. On October 11th, 1980, Bill and Marlene got into a very loud argument. It was such a loud argument that Mr. St. Hilaire, who was on the trailer behind the property, he decided to leave the property that night to cool off. When he got home sometime around midnight, he actually saw Bill Major, and Bill appeared to be disheveled, he was in disarray. Marlene was gone, and so were the kids. He told Mr. St. Hilaire that Marlene abducted the two children and stormed off in the car. But the reality is, is he actually dropped the two kids off at a neighbor's house that night. Mr. St. Hilaire would then notify police within a day or two that he was suspicious that something had happened to Marlene. 
because he had then found out about Bill's lies that night. Police searched their home and they found nothing. They found no signs of foul play, no blood or any signs of a struggle. They didn't have any witnesses to say that they saw or heard anything. And so their hands were kind of tied. They did ask Bill Major, hey, will you take a polygraph test? And he said, no, I will not. And then right after that, he took the two kids and moved to his native state of Rhode Island while continuing to deny that he had anything to do with Marlene's disappearance. A year after Marlene disappeared and only about a mile away from where she lived, a hunter found a severed skull in the woods. There was no other parts of the body with it. When reported to police, it would go to a forensic anthropologist and they had examined the skull and they said that this person clearly died of a gunshot wound. Now, the skull was missing all of its teeth. Someone had removed the teeth and tried to remove the jaw altogether. But because of this, they couldn't compare dental records to this person. They did have those assumptions, well, this may be Marlene, because the forensic anthropologist determined that this was the skull of a white woman who was probably somewhere between the ages of 25 to 30. Marlene was 25 years old. But back in 1980, they did not have the DNA technology to extract and create a profile. And so the skull kind of just stayed in evidence. Several years goes by and Bill Major is remarried now to this woman here. Well, the two kids will confess to her that their father was sexually abusing them. And so she goes straight to police. And because of that, Bill Major is arrested and he is charged with sexual molestation of his kids. The kids are then put into the custody of their maternal grandmother, Marlene's mom, and that's who they remained with for the rest you know, of their childhood. Bill served 11 years of a 15-year sentence. Growing up, the kids believed that their mother abandoned them because that's what their father told them. They were never really told anything about like the disappearance and, or, or anything like foul play related. But by the time Lalana turned about 19 or 20 years old, she went to the sheriff's department and said, hey, I want to look at the file you have on my mom. And because the sheriff's department hands were tied because they didn't really have much like, to work with, and because she was a private citizen, they did give her the, the file and she went through everything paper by paper and they, she interviewed a whole bunch of people. And then she also discovered that there was that skull found a year after the disappearance, but that they couldn't do anything with it back when it was discovered. She found out about mitochondrial DNA in 2001 or so. And now that DNA technology had advanced so much, she discovered that they could take mitochondrial DNA from that skull. Now, initially, I think someone in her family was gonna surrender like $20,000 to pay for this test, but eventually the state of Kentucky would pay for that test. And they took uh, her DNA and they compared it to the DNA from the skull using mitochondrial DNA. And it was a match. The skull belonged to her mother. And now they had confirmation that Marlene, in fact, was dead. And she was murdered. Enter another hero in this case. Bill Major's own father. When Bill was in jail for the molestation charges, he actually confessed to his dad that he actually killed Marlene. He went to police, but unfortunately at that time, they weren't recording jailhouse calls. And so they didn't have that proof. They only had just what he said. But unbelievably, he would say to police, listen, you can tap my phones and I'll get my son to confess again. And it worked. I keep getting calls from Lalana and she wants to know where her mother is so that she can get the bones and put them in a casket and have closure. Yeah, and put me in jail for life. You have pulled off the perfect crime, haven't you? No, I wouldn't call it perfect. No. Because if a crime was perfect, nobody would ever know about it. And with that phone call, police had enough to finally charge Bill Major with the murder of his wife, Marlene. He was arrested and charged in 2001. He goes on trial in 2003, and on July 28th, 2003, he is found guilty of the murder, and he is sentenced to life in prison without parole. There was a brief moment in time where his conviction was overturned due to some technicality, and he was ordered a second trial. He goes through another one, and he's once again found guilty, and once again sentenced to life in prison without parole. He was supposed to be attending a NASCAR event. Instead, he's never been seen since. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Michael Broham. Viewer discretion is advised.
At the time this case occurred, Michael Broham, who would go by Mickey, he was 54 years old, he was not married, he did not have any children, and he was living in Belchertown, Massachusetts. Michael enjoyed very much going to NASCAR events, and that's what he was supposed to be doing on June 24th, 2010. He was going to be attending the NASCAR event here at the New Hampshire Motor Speedway in Loudoun, New Hampshire. But whether or not Michael actually made it there is unclear because Michael was never seen or heard from by his family ever again. When they arrived at his home, they found Michael's motorcycle and his vehicle parked in the driveway. But Michael was not home, so he was officially reported missing by his family. Two days after he was reported missing, his wallet was found. I guess it was off of Route 106, just across from the motor speedway. And then a day or so after that, his cell phone is found, along with his watch. And those were found roughly a mile away from where his wallet was discovered. But again, no trace of Michael. There have been no witnesses who said they saw Michael at the motor speedway. And so that's why they're not even sure if he made it into the speedway. But his belongings were found very close to it, so how did he get there and what happened? Michael did own a cat, which was left behind at his home. He did not leave any food in his cat's dish. And if Michael was ever going to be gone for any period of time, you know, more than like a couple of days, he would notify family or friends to check in on his cat and feed him. But he didn't do that. His cat was, you know, was fine because they went to his house, but that was completely out of his character to just not feed his cat and to just leave his cat unattended. He loved it. And judging by the state of his home, it didn't appear that Michael intended to be gone. Like, nothing was missing, like there was no suitcases packed or anything like that. And so something happened to him. But what that something is, nobody knows. There is, unfortunately, very little information on his case, and there really just isn't much of an update. There doesn't appear to have been many leads or tips that have come in. Did Michael meet with foul play along the way? Nobody knows. No trace of him has ever been found. Michael has a tattoo of a wolf on his upper left shoulder. He has a surgical scar on his sternum. He was about five foot six, and at the time of his disappearance, he was somewhere between 190 to 220 pounds. He's also diabetic and has coronary artery disease. He takes medication for those issues, but all of those were left behind at his house, further leading to the speculation that he may have met with foul play. Somebody somewhere out there knows the truth about what happened to Michael. If that somebody is you, please contact the authorities at 413-323-6685. This is one of the most baffling cases I think I've ever covered. Hello, true crimeers. This is the mysterious death of Michelle von Emster. Viewer discretion is advised. This is going to be a very long video. It's 10 minutes. So this will be the only video I post today. It was a chilly April 15th, 1994 morning in San Diego, California. Two surfers were planning to surf that morning off the Sunset Cliffs, but they found a bunch of seagulls sitting on top of something adrift in the water. What they found here was something incredibly gruesome. It was the badly torn apart and deceased body of a young woman, later identified as 25-year-old Michelle von Emster. Michelle was missing part of her right leg from the thigh down. She had several broken ribs, scrapes, bruises, and contusions. Her neck was broken. She also had large chunks of flesh missing from her body. And one of the most mysterious parts was that there was copious amounts of sand found in her mouth, her throat, her lungs, and her stomach. The coroner determined that in order for that to have happened, she would have had to take one giant breath in in order to swallow the amount of sand found in her body. So what caused this? And when did it happen? Well, Michelle von Emster was last seen alive at approximately 8 p.m. the night prior. She had been dropped off at the Sunset Cliffs area by her friend, her roommate. They determined that she would have had to have entered the water sometime around 12 a.m. And this is where the mystery comes in. So at first, the coroner would rule that this was a shark attack, specifically a great white shark attack. That was extremely unusual because it was beyond rare. Previous to this, there had only been, I believe, two total great white shark attacks in the past like 100 years in that San Diego area. I mean, I'm originally from there and I don't recall ever being told to look out for sharks in our oceans. But that's what the coroner said happened, and that's why her leg was missing, which was never found. And it was pretty much case closed for him, until some experts chimed in. 
Not one, but several different shark experts would all come to a pretty similar conclusion. Michelle's injuries weren't even remotely close to what you would see with a great white shark attack. When a great white attacks a person, like if they're biting off their leg, a very renowned expert in this would say that it's typically a very clean bite, almost as if you run a table saw through it. But Michelle's leg was far from that. It was completely mangled. One person described it as, let me read this, it looked like what happens when you get a piece of bamboo and whittle it down to a point with a knife. And this man looked at her autopsy photos and compared it to all of the photos of previous great white attacks that he has seen. Her case, Michelle, was not even at all close to any of those other ones. There was also not one single tooth found in the body, which is extremely common with these types of attacks. A tooth breaks off and gets lodged in the victim's body. That being said, these experts would confirm that there were bite marks on her body indicative of a blue shark. But blue sharks cannot bite off a person's leg, especially in one bite. So they've discovered that the bite marks on her body from the blue sharks were done post-mortem, after she was already deceased. They must have, you know, her blood was in the water and they just began to, you know, bite on her. This would be confirmed in 2008. Everyone would concur that this, the bite marks on her body were done after she was dead. So if Michelle wasn't killed by a shark, how did she die? I believe the ultimate cause of her death was ruled as drowning, but it's also extremely uncommon to see sand in a person's throat and stomach if they've drowned in water. And again, she would have had to take one giant gulp of sand to get what was found in her body in her body. And then going back to the great white shark thing for a moment, even them, when they attack a person, they don't bring him down to the very bottom of the, of the water so that the victim can take in sand. So how did the sand get in her body like that? Well, there are two kind of theories. Michelle was found completely nude in the water, which was yet another baffling aspect of this. Michelle did love to swim. She was an avid swimmer. And one person in particular would say that she usually did swim naked at night, but only one person said that and none of her other friends can corroborate that. Her clothing was never found. However, her purse was found on the beach. Nothing was stolen from it. So one theory is that she was swimming and then she was just taken by a wave and crashed against the the wall of the cliffs. And in doing so, she must have kind of swept with the sand and gotten sand in her body. That would attribute to some of the injuries, but not her missing leg. Another theory is that she was at the top of the cliffs and she was either pushed off or accidentally fell. That would attribute to like her broken neck and several of the other injuries, but again, not the missing leg. And then possibly if that happened and she landed on the beach, she may have been landed face first and then just inhaled a bunch of sand because maybe she couldn't move. And then perhaps the water just took her out. But then where are her clothes? Again, they weren't found. And also to add on to the swimming aspect, if she was just going out there for a night swim, nobody did that in, in April uh, in San Diego. The water was below 60 degrees. The air was about 59 degrees that night. No one in their right mind would go swimming, especially nude, in that frigid water. Not to say it's impossible, it's just not something you see. There is also a theory that she had been murdered. Michelle lived in a rough part of town. A lot of crime, especially drug-related crime. Michelle herself had recently taken into the drug world. They nicknamed this area the War Zone. She could have just met with the wrong person just by sheer coincidence, and they killed her and then threw her off the cliff. There was a suspect named Edwin Decker, someone who worked with Michelle, someone who had romantic feelings for her. It would be him who was the one person that would say that Michelle liked to surf and swim nude, but nobody else could confirm that. It's possible he said that just to cover his tracks. A rape kit was never done on Michelle. He actually would say that he believed that the two of them had a strong connection, but then he said, well, at least on my end, I thought that. Is it possible she spurned his advances? And he didn't like that. He wrote a poem, and the poem said this. The report said there was a tattoo, a butterfly on her shoulder, which I remembered that night on my couch when I, like the shark, chewed on her lips and took off her shirt. Kind of weird. Allegedly, the two of them had a sexual interaction about 24 hours prior. However, in 2008, Edwin Decker was the one person to 
pushed the San Diego coroner's office to relook into her case and determine exactly how she died. He was pushing for it. That's not something that you typically would see from a murder victim. If this is a cold case, they're not going to want to rehash it. But maybe they do to make them look, you know, less guilty. Another theory is that Michelle had a stalker at her job. There was a man that nobody knew his name, and he would really creep, specifically, Michelle out all the time. And apparently this man, or just a man, would take photocopies of her autopsy report, which was also strange. But who that man is, no one knows. No person has ever been charged with, indicted, or anything in connection with her death. In 2021, there would be one final theory, and it is heartbreaking. According to Michelle's sister, who wrote an article, Michelle had been the repeated victim of a serial pedophile priest named Greg Ingalls of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church covered up his crimes. Michelle would never be the same after all of that. It led her into a life of alcoholism, addiction, insistent medical issues, depression. There is a strong possibility that Michelle willingly jumped off of that cliff and ended her own life. Like I said earlier, a fall off a cliff or a jump off a cliff or being pushed off would account for a lot of her injuries, but not the missing leg. And it's still pretty difficult to figure out exactly why all of that sand was in her body. If she was pushed off the cliff or if she willingly jumped off or accidentally fell, they don't know why her purse was on the bottom of the cliff while she was at the top and they don't know where her clothes are. So some of these things are just baffling and un they're unknown. So how did she lose her leg though? There is one other working theory that no matter how she came to be in the water, there is a working theory that possibly there was a speedboat or some kind of boat that was in the water that night that may have come into contact with her already deceased body. And that would explain the cause of her leg being removed and why it looked so just kind of torn up and why there were chunks of flesh missing from her body. It's very likely that the person who did that had absolutely no idea that they even hit anything, or thought maybe they just hit a log or something. And then, once her body was drifting, the blue sharks could have found her and kind of, like, nibbled. There are many aspects of this that just don't make sense. They really can't even pinpoint exactly what her cause of death was, like what led to it, what happened. Nobody knows, still, to this day. All they have is theories. And the theories can be so wildly different from one another. The only thing people really know for sure was that Michelle von Emster was last seen alive at 8 p.m. on April 14th, 1994. And by the following morning, her body was found brutally torn apart. Her family may never truly know the answer. And the baffling death of Michelle von Emster may forever remain unsolved. What would my 80s yearbook photo look like? Let's find out, shall we? Jesus H. Christ, the baddest baddie at the school. Is my face attached to my body with string? And I have devil horns? That looks like my face was ripped off of somebody else's head and then stuck to this dude's face head thing. Who did I murder? Am I... Is this the origin story of Leatherface? Is that who... What is, okay, well, uh, hey ladies, how you doing, huh? Oh, yuck. Okay, well, well, fuck my life. This is the last known image of a 13-year-old girl just moments before she vanished forever. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Naziah Harris. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Nazia Harris was just 13 years old, living in the Detroit area of Michigan. On January 9th, 2024, Nazia had gone to school, and then at the end of school, she got onto the school bus, which is, this is the exact image of her on the bus. She then got off the school bus at the corner of Cornwall and Three Mile Drive, but then Nazia never got home. By later that afternoon, her grandmother would report her missing. Initially, it sounded like police really kind of just were working this as like a runaway, and they initially did not do an Amber Alert. But days go by, and then weeks, and then months, and there's no sign of her. Obviously, something has happened to her. So the police in their investigation, they've obtained certain warrants to search certain areas. They have gone through certain bodies of water, but they had never found any sign of her, any trace, nothing. 
for months. All they were hopeful for was that Nazaya was out there somewhere safe, at least safe enough to bring home alive. But also, unfortunately, the more time that passes, it's not usually a good sign. And then just yesterday, September 27th, 2024, there was a very significant update in this case. An arrest has been made. 41-year-old Detroit resident Jarvis Butts was arrested and charged with connections to the Naziah Harris disappearance. Unfortunately, at the press conference they held, the DA said that they now have evidence that Naziah is deceased, that Naziah was likely murdered the day she went missing. Naziah and Jarvis knew each other. Jarvis had actually gotten his, her aunt pregnant, and then they would announce through this investigation that they pulled up like hundreds of hours of surveillance footage. They have pulled a whole bunch of cell phone data, receipts, and everything pointed to that day, Naziah got off the school bus and met up with Jarvis Butts. They have a text message that came from Naziah's tablet to Jarvis's cell phone, and there was a plan to meet. They had evidence that Naziah and Jarvis met up with one of Jarvis's co-workers. And then at 9.30 p.m. that night, Jarvis booked a motel room and they confirmed that with receipts and surveillance footage. And from that point moving forward, there was never any sign of Naziah ever again. Jarvis, he would befriend adult women who had young girls, uh, you know, daughters. He befriended the women to initiate sexual contact with their children, in which he had previously raped Naziah Harris. And according to uh, text messages, Naziah had told him that she had missed her period, and that it was believed that Naziah had gotten pregnant from him. And they have uh, data pulled from his devices that he had been searching up things like abortions, abortion pills, antifreeze, and then he had that final contact with Naziah on January 9th when she disappeared. Naziah's body has not been recovered. I don't know if they are currently working with him to see if he will tell them where she is, but I do know that they firmly believe that Naziah is deceased. He has been charged with first-degree premeditated murder, second-degree criminal sexual contact, and child sexually abusive activity. He has also been charged with two more cases where he raped uh, girls under the age of 13. He has a probable cause hearing for October 4th and then a preliminary hearing on October 10th. It sounds very much like he is the guy that he killed her, but if he's not gonna cooperate in terms of saying where she is, somebody somewhere out there might know where she is. He may have told people where he put her. If you have information about the whereabouts of Naziah Harris, you can report that information anonymously to 1-800-SPEAK-UP. And hopefully her family is able to bring her home soon and lay her to rest. And then hopefully very soon, Naziah and her family will get the justice she very rightfully deserves. A family in California is asking for the public's help to help locate a missing mother of four. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Nikki Chang Saley McCain. Viewer discretion is advised. So this is a very recent case, and it happened up here in Northern California in the Redding Rancheria area. Nikki Saley Chang McCain is a 39-year-old mother to four children, and she is in an estranged marriage with this man here, Tyler McCain. Nikki's sisters, who she's pictured here with, they describe Nikki as goofy, she's silly, she's incredibly outgoing, and that she just finds everything funny. And that of the four of them, Nikki definitely had the most personality. And the four sisters are extremely close. In terms of her marriage, uh, Tyler McCain, who has a rap sheet, in December of 2023, he had been charged with domestic violence uh, committed against Nikki. Nikki would tell police that towards the end of November that basically Tyler beat her up and he threatened to kill her. When she spoke to police, she had black eyes. It was very evident that she had been beaten up. Tyler McCain would deny it. He tried to say that it was another woman who beat Nikki up. He made this outlandish accusation that she was involved with another woman. And then I think at one point he said, oh, it must have been another man. His story kept changing about how Nikki got beat up. 
Now at that time, both Nikki and Tyler did not have access to their children. Due to the volatile relationship between Nikki and Tyler, the kids were essentially taken out of the home and placed in the care of a family member. I don't know where which family members the children are with right now though. On May 21st, 2024, so just a few months ago, Nikki would be reported missing to police in Redding, California by her family. Her family spoke to her sometime around the night of May 17th. They tried to uh, call her and text her the next day. She didn't respond, but that was not completely out of the norm. Like they had this, the, the sisters had this group chat, but it was normal for any of them to, to not communicate back within three or four days. So I didn't really think much of it. But then by May 21st, when the family spoke to Tyler, Tyler said that he hadn't seen her either in a couple of days. And that's when they decided to report her missing. When she was reported missing, all of the charges against Tyler McCain were dropped. The DA said that that's the best thing to do for this case while Nikki is missing. I do believe he was out the entire time, but this would prompt a protest. Um, Nikki's family, friends, and the community would protest and say that, you know, this is ridiculous that you guys just basically dropped all charges against him. But the thing of the, of the matter is, is that Nikki was the only witness to the abuse. And so they don't have her testimony. And so there is, you know, that logic there that they really can't move forward without Nikki. But at the same time, it's like, where is Nikki though? Does those domestic abuse charges have something to do with why she is now missing? So the last time on May 17th that they spoke to her, uh, they communicated through text. Nikki said she was dropping, I guess, the a vehicle off at her mother-in-law's home. And her mother-in-law lived on the uh, Redding Rancheria, the tribal area. Then she told family that she would be getting a ride home from there, you know, back to her home. But Nikki never got home. According to some witnesses, Nikki was last seen in the area of the Wind River Casino. But nobody knows what really happened to her after that. Tyler tried to say that uh, an Uber might, might have picked her up. And the Uber, he says, would have picked her up outside of the Wind River Casino. But then I guess there's another story that it was one of, of his friends that picked her up outside the casino and was going to drive her home. There doesn't seem to be like what the actual story is. It doesn't seem to be known for sure. There does not appear to be any uber records though of her being picked up now she also had her own vehicle which had gone missing at the same time but that vehicle was found um, on may 25th and it was quite a long distance away from where she was last seen how it got there though they don't really seem to know nikki was not in it she wasn't around it meanwhile her family her friends and volunteers are searching the area they are searching on foot they are looking everywhere they can for her. They are even searching by air. They are a little limited on where they can search though because there are certain parts of the tribal grounds that they're not allowed to be on. But there's also, they're trying to say that basically there's no evidence to suggest that she met with foul play anywhere on the reservation. There really is no actual evidence of foul play at all. But at the same time, she is missing. I want to say they've, you know, checked the whole cell phone data thing and they just haven't located her that way. She hasn't communicated to anyone. As far as I know, none of her bank accounts have been used and there's been no sightings of her at all. You also got Tyler who's telling multiple different stories. Oh, she was involved with a lesbian lover. She ran off with her. But who that person is, he can't say. It was that woman who beat her up that time. It wasn't me. Or it was a, another man who did it to her. Uh, she was picked up by an Uber. Oh, no, she wasn't. She was picked up by a, a friend of mine. Not to mention that he had all these charges of domestic violence against her. And then poof, she's gone. But again, there's no signs of foul play. But her family just wants to know where she is. They, they want her back home. She has four children. And somebody out there has got to know what happened to her. I mean, this just happened. Somebody knows. If you have any information about the whereabouts of Nikki Chang, Saley McCain, please call any one of these numbers here. Help bring Nikki home. 63 years ago, a young man was found stabbed to death in the UK. His murder has remained unsolved. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Patrick Mulligan. Viewer discretion is advised. This case occurred in Worcester in the UK. I do apologize if I said that right. I've been looking at pronunciations, I swear. Unfortunately, I do not have any photos of the victim. It was a little past midnight on April 8th, 1961. 
A 22-year-old man who's later identified as Patrick Mulligan was seen staggering down Commandry Road in Worcester. He collapses near the Worcester Cathedral, and at first people who saw him thought, okay, he's just a drunk guy. It made sense with that, you know, time of night, but then when people got closer to him, they realized there was blood pooling out of him, and there was a trail of blood leading from behind him. This man had been stabbed. The young man would be rushed to the hospital, but by the time he got there, he would be pronounced dead. Police followed the trail of blood that was leading from behind him, and it ended up getting here to this location. These were, I guess, public restrooms along Commandry Road. And it was more than evident that the stabbing attack started here. According to witnesses, there was a man observed in this area who was described as being roughly 50 years old, and he was at least six foot tall, if not taller. I don't have a lot of information on this, but I guess at one point pretty soon afterwards, a couple of construction guys were actually arrested and charged with his murder. But then since there was no physical evidence whatsoever connecting them, the charges were dropped. And then a month after the murder happened, this man here, who was described as a transient, his name was Clifford Newsham, he was arrested and charged with the murder. All of this despite the fact that he said he had never even been to Worcester before. And he certainly wasn't there at the time of this murder. Something that he nor police at the time could confirm. Lucky for him, he was given a very, very good uh, lawyer. The lawyer pointed out some things that were pretty obvious from the get-go. First of all, he was definitely not 50 years old. At the time of the murder, he was about 39. Second, he was well under six feet tall. He did not fit the description of the man who was seen near those restrooms at the time of the murder. But it didn't matter, I guess, to them because he still went to trial for it. But at his trial, there would be a police officer from London who said without a shadow of a doubt, he saw this man in London the night the murder took place. And this was a very, very long ways away from where the murder happened. And then they also could not show any evidence, the prosecution, any physical evidence, no DNA, no fingerprints, nothing connecting him to the murder. And so eventually he is found not guilty. And it doesn't sound like anyone actually believes at this point that he was responsible for it. But the thing of the matter is, somebody was. And that somebody got away with it. With this being about 63 years later, the killer being described as someone who is 50 years old, he would be long dead. I mean, even if he was in his late 30s or 40s, he's probably no longer with us. So this killer got away with it. And I wish I had a photo of Patrick Mulligan to share. I wish I knew anything about him, but there's very little published about his life and there's no photos I can find. But at least you can do something by putting his name out there to know that his story did matter and that people do care that he was brutally murdered for what, nobody knows why. But even with his killer very likely dead, the very least that we can do is make sure his name and his story continues on. Some say accident, some say foul play, and some, UFO abduction. Hello, true crimeers. This is the mysterious disappearance of Paula Jean Weldon. Viewer discretion is advised. Paula Jean Weldon, born in 1928, was one of four siblings, and she was born and raised in Samford, Connecticut. By 1946, Paula is a sophomore at Bennington College, which is located in North Bennington, Vermont. It was December 1st, 1946. She had just finished working her shift at the uh, dinner hall there in Bennington College. According to her dorm room roommate, she would enter the dorm room and change into more comfortable, like, walking clothes. She brought nothing with her. No purse, no anything. She told her roommate, I'm gonna go take a, you know, a nice little walk, and I'll see you later. But later, never came. What they do know is that Paula would then hitchhike, and she got a ride to within about two miles or so of the Long Trail, which is a 270 plus mile long trail that runs from Vermont all the way to Canada. She specifically was near the Glastonbury Mountain portion. Now the person who picked her up would get take her as far as where his house was. Like I said, it was still two and a half miles from here. And no one really knows from that point how she got the rest of the way. There would be some hikers who would later state that they definitely saw Paula Jean Weldon. She was walking on her own and she actually stopped for a few moments to talk to this group and ask them some questions about the long trail. They saw her then continue to walk on her own in a northern direction. Paula walked into the now darkening woods and has never been seen again. 
The following morning, her college dorm roommate would report her missing after she woke up that morning and didn't see Paula there. There were no indications that Paula ever even got back to the school. Once the school was notified, they, they basically shut the school down and they conducted a very thorough search of the entire grounds. They didn't have their own local police at that time, but they did get the sheriff's office and I guess the DA. All these people got involved and eventually a massive search began. This included the use of helicopters. They put out Paula's image to see if anyone saw her. And that's when the guy would come forward to say, hey, I picked her up and I dropped her off at this location. And then there would be those witnesses who said that we saw her at the long trail by herself. A couple other witnesses would also come forward to state they also saw Paula just walking along the trail. But they did not stop and interact with her. But they definitely saw her. And once again, she was alone. They had hundreds and hundreds of people searching for her. This included her family, all the students at the school. They did not find a single trace of her. And this was one of the largest and most thorough searches they've ever conducted at that point. They didn't find a trace of her, nothing. They know Paula was there at that, on that trail. And they know she was alone for at least some of that time. But what happened to her? Reportedly, there was a lumberjack who actually lived in that area. His name was Fred Gadette. He lived along Harbor Road, which is the path or the road next to where Paula was seen walking. This guy reportedly got into an argument with his wife or girlfriend, and he left his home in a very, in a big angry rage. He stormed off. He admits he actually saw Paula Jean Weldon walking along the trail on her own. Fred Gadette would give police multiple different versions of a story. Fast forwarding to 1955, he reportedly tells people that he actually knows with within about 100 feet or so of where Paula is buried. So the authorities would bring him in for questioning and eventually he just folded and said that he made up the part about burying her body or know where she's buried. He said he did it for attention, but he was never charged with anything. There was even a point where Paula's own father was considered a suspect. Once he found out she disappeared, he went to the trail himself and he vanished for 36 hours. Her and her father had gotten into a pretty extreme argument days before all of this, and it was about a, a guy she was seeing. He then says he went to a psychic, and the psychic told him that the person who she was dating at the time that he didn't approve of was the one responsible for her disappearance. But nothing has come from that either. And nothing has come from in terms of like the father being a suspect. There's also a possibility that she got into an accident somewhere. She fell, she tripped, and this ended up hurting herself severely, and then possibly dying from that. The only problem with that is they did an extremely thorough search of this entire area, and they never found a trace of her. Even all the way now, they've never found skeletal remains or anything. So it, it does seem like if she was there, she is no longer there, unless she's buried somewhere. Paula Jean Weldon is also considered one of the five of the Bennington Triangle. Five people over the course of like a five year span mysteriously disappeared in what they call like the Bennington version of the, uh, the Bermuda Triangle, which has also led to speculation of UFOs. The Bennington area, I guess, has been a hotspot in past years with being a site for many UFO sightings and possible alien abductions. And literally there were theories that Paula Jean Weldon was abducted by aliens from that area. Obviously, there's no proof of that, but it was a pretty substantial, strong theory just because of how she was just there and there has been no trace of her ever found ever again. It's just odd. But are aliens responsible? Probably not. The truth of the matter is, nobody knows what happened to Paula on that day, December 1st, 1946. She entered a hiking trail and then never seen again. Did she meet with foul play? Personally, I think that's the strongest possibility. That lumberjack sure is suspicious, but even if he was a suspect, he's long gone now. But whatever may have happened to Paula Jean Weldon, unless they find her body somewhere, her story may remain a mystery forever. He was pinned between the top of an elevator and the floor for an hour in a worse death imaginable that never should have happened. Viewer discretion is advised. This story happened here in this apartment building in Atlanta, Georgia, and it occurred in August of 2021. The victim in this case was just 18 years old, and he was a football player. He, along with two of his teammates, would get into an elevator in this building. So at one point, the elevator stops at the third floor, the door opens. But as people begin to walk out of it, suddenly the elevator begins to collapse. I'm going to show you some CCTV footage, but I want to let you know there is absolutely nothing graphic shown. It's cut off before anything like that happens. 
and this is in slow motion, but you can see how the elevator is falling and people are trying to escape. So this young man here, he is about halfway out of the elevator when it fully collapses. And so it's the top of the elevator and then the floor here where he is stuck halfway in between both. So he's partially in the elevator, partially on the floor. And he ends up getting crushed by the weight of the elevator. And pretty much it sounds like it's really him, his body, preventing the thing from going down all the way. The people in the elevator said they saw his legs kicking, he was screaming, and then an ambulance and firefighters arrive and he is literally stuck in that position for like an hour. But he has a massive amount of weight being crushed down on him and the feet begin to slowly stop wiggling. His screams become quieter. He could not pull him out. It, it took them a very long time to finally get him out of there. By the time they were able to get him on a stretcher, it was too late. The 18 year old would be pronounced dead. He suffered for somewhere between 30 minutes to an hour. And why did it happen? Well, they would find out through a whistleblower that the maintenance in this building was not anywhere near to code. At the elevators themselves, they knew about malfunctions and they deliberately didn't repair them to save money. And because of that, it created an extremely dangerous elevator that killed someone. I know that the family of the victim filed a wrongful death lawsuit against them, but I don't know the outcome of that or if it has even been resolved yet. There should be no way in hell that they won't win big though. But I'm sure no amount of money in the world will be enough because in the end, they just want their son back. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of this sad grace son of a bitch, Robert Danielson. Viewer discretion is advised. I do not have any photos of the victims, unfortunately. On June 23rd, 1970, Robert Danielson got into an argument with a young man named Thomas Davis. The argument would lead to Robert taking out a gun and shooting him and killing him. So Robert was arrested and charged with first degree murder. His first trial ended in a mistrial because of prosecutorial issues. And before a second trial could occur, he would end up pleading guilty to voluntary manslaughter. He was sentenced to 25 years with the possibility of parole, and parole is exactly what he got. After just 11 years, he was released from the Oregon State Penitentiary. Shortly after that, his murder spree would begin. It was December 10th, 1981, in the deserts of Arizona at a campsite. 60-year-old Harold Pratt and his 55-year-old wife Betty were found brutally murdered at their campsite. They had been shot in the back of the head execution style, and it was very clear that this was also a robbery. Fast forward to June 25th, 1982, at the Twin Springs Campground in Oregon, 62-year-old Arthur Gray Jr. was found shot to death at his campsite, execution style, and also he was robbed. Now along the way, Robert would meet a 14-year-old girl who he struck up a relationship with, whose name was Lenora Hart Johnson, whose photo I can't find. But she would accompany him on his murder spree. He then goes back to the Arizona area near the border of California, along with his 14-year-old girlfriend, where they run into Benjamin and Edith Schaefer. They were a couple who were both in their 60s. Their bodies weren't discovered until December of 1983, but both of them had also been shot to death and robbed. Then they found themselves in Apache Junction, Arizona. A 38-year-old man named Ernest Coral was found shot to death in a ravine in the desert. Now, along with that attack, there was another couple that were actually also attacked, but this couple would survive. They told police that they met another couple in the desert while they were camping. And at one point, the man and the couple took some kind of syringe and injected it into both of these two people. Their names were Edwin and Ida. Well, the couple became unconscious from whatever was in this vial and they were robbed. Luckily, someone stumbled across them in time to get them to a hospital to save them. They would give a composite drawing of the guy to describe him. They also had uh, mug shots from the police that they could look at, and they absolutely identified Robert Danielson as their attacker. And in his company was a very a much younger looking girl. Now, Lenora was eventually captured, but he had already fled. I don't know what happened to her though. I don't see exactly what became of, of her. But they finally tracked Robert Danielson after some time. They finally found him at the beginning of 1984 all the way in Odessa, Texas. He was then charged with multiple murders in multiple states. He first goes on trial in California for the killings of the Schaefers. He is found guilty on all charges and 
He begs for his life. He says, please do not give me the death penalty. But that's exactly what he got. He was sentenced to death for the murder of the Schaefers. Womp womp. Then he was extradited to Oregon to face more murder charges where he would also be found guilty of murders up there, but they don't have the death penalty. And so he was sentenced to life in prison. But then he was sent back to his prison in California to await his death sentence. But the piece of shit was too cowardice to wait for his own death sentence. On September 7th, 1995, in his cell at San Quentin, he was found hanging by a bedsheet. He ended his own life. So in total, including the first victim that he got paroled for, he murdered seven people. If he never was paroled, maybe all of those other six victims would still be alive. But he would have still gotten out after 25 years, and who knows what he would have done then. But I guess at least he can't hurt anyone ever again now. You are out there somewhere, and you will be caught, so just come forward. Hello, True Crimeers. This is the very recent case of Shantae Reeves. Viewer discretion is advised. 32-year-old Shantae Reeves lived in the Douglasville, Georgia area. She was the incredibly loving and giving mother to an 11-year-old girl. Shantae was beautiful, described as an angel. Her mother described her as a servant to the community. She loved helping in the community. Shantae was somebody's daughter. She was somebody's sister. She was somebody's niece. She was somebody's mother. And her life was tragically taken in August of 2024. It was August 4th, 2024, at approximately 1.40 a.m., along the shoulder of the I-20, which was near the Moreland Avenue area. Shantae Reeves had been walking along the shoulder of that road, when all of a sudden, at least two cars that were clearly doing some speed racing, going over what investigators have said was over 100 miles per hour, and struck Shantae Reeves head on. The circled vehicle there is one of at least two vehicles that were known to be racing. It was this car on the far right that actually struck her. Shantae was killed instantly, and she was run over by at least four total cars. Her body was destroyed. Her mother would say that her body was in pieces. The only way they could even identify her is just through her tattoos. The drivers that did this, that hit her, they did not even stop for a moment. And there is absolutely no way they did not notice that they hit her. They struck her and they just kept driving. As did the other vehicles that ran her over after she was already down. Not one person stopped. Not one person said, oh my God, I just hit someone. I, you know, I need to stop it. I need to call 911 immediately. No, they didn't do that. And now it's almost a month later and nobody knows who was driving those vehicles. Nobody has ever come forward. Nobody has ever provided tips. The incident of the street racing was caught on this camera. Initially, they thought one of the vehicles may have been a black Mustang. However, upon closer inspection, they realized that it's actually a black Lexus that hit her. Now, the car that hit her direct on would have some very serious damage to it and the driver of that vehicle may have taken it into a shop to get repaired. There would have also probably been blood and other material on the car. So that means somebody else, other than the person driving, somebody else knows who that driver is. And you're not doing anyone any favors by hiding that person's identity. Let me remind you, she was a mother to an 11-year-old daughter who just had to bury her mother, and it could not even be an open casket because her body was in pieces. Somebody somewhere out there knows who did this. And if you know who it is, stop covering for them. Report your information anonymously if you have to, but just report it. If you have any information, please call 404-577-8477. Help Shantae, her mother, her daughter, her family, and her friends get the justice she rightfully deserves. Do the right thing. An Alabama mother is found slain inside her home, and to this day, they still have no idea who did it. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Sherry Therese Smith. Fewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Sherry Smith was a 32-year-old mother to two children, and they lived in the really small town of Fairfield, which is in Alabama. Sherry was the mother to two children. She had one son and a daughter, and her kids meant absolutely everything to her. They were her entire world. Her daughter would describe um, Sherry as vivacious and funny. She worked really, really hard to support her kids. She was a financial associate at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. 
But at night, sometimes Sherry just liked to cut loose and go out with her friends and have a good time. She was the epitome of a people person. She really loved being around people. And there just wasn't anyone who just didn't immediately love her. At the time of this case, she had a boyfriend and her kids uh, liked the boyfriend. It sounded like that there were other people who were not so happy about this relationship. Apparently, Sherry had been attacked by a woman who had injured uh, Sherry's arm in some way. I think that had something to do with the, the boyfriend she was seeing, but I'm not 100% sure. Four months before her case occurs, someone breaks into her home and steals the handgun that she owned. And at that time, there was no forced entry. And her boyfriend told her, you know, you really need to change your locks and also get an alarm system. And she did end up getting an alarm system, but she had not replaced the locks of her home yet. Which takes us to November 21st, 2011 at approximately 4.30 a.m. Fairfield, Alabama police are, they receive a call that an alarm had been tripped at a residence. And it happens to be Sherry Smith's house. When police enter the home, they find Sherry on her bed and she is deceased. Sherry had been shot multiple times. There was no forced entry in the home, just like with the robbery four months prior. There was absolutely no sign of a burglary either. According to the boyfriend and according to her children, there was nothing of value taken from the home. No money was missing or anything. What her daughter, who at that point was actually a teenager, her daughter had come to this conclusion that Whoever killed Sherry, her mom, was probably already in the house throughout the day, like hiding in the house. There was even a point because her, her teenage daughter was having a sleepover because this was like Thanksgiving weekend. So her daughter came back to the house just to get a couple of things with her mom because her mom had just gotten home from a trip herself. And then when after, after all this happened, she kind of thinks to herself, oh my God, that whoever did this was probably in the house when I was in there too and may have been hiding out in the home over the weekend while Sherry was out of town and then just sat in her house laying in wait, waiting for Sherry to come home. Based on the nature of the attack, the police do believe that this was probably someone who knew her because the, the murder seemed very personal. The gunshots, you know, came from a close range and there were multiple shots. Like he, this person kept shooting and shooting. And the coroner also found multiple stab wounds. This was done by someone who hated Sherry or was really pissed off at her for something. To shoot someone several times and then also stab them. That is the MO of a very personal murder. But who that person is, is still unknown. I do believe the boyfriend has been ruled out that, you know, he is not a suspect. Police have announced that they did collect several pieces of evidence, including like forensic evidence, but they have not specified what that evidence is. Like if it's fingerprints, DNA, hair, shoe impressions, a combination of all of it, it's not really known. They have also said that there is a couple persons of interest that they've had over the years, but they've never released any of those names publicly. But they know that this was overkill. The stab wounds weren't even necessary. She would already have been dead. So they have looked into people in her life, they've questioned everyone in her life, and they just haven't been able to come up with a genuine suspect, at least not one that can arrest and you know go to trial with, because they wanna make sure they have all the evidence so that there is no reasonable doubt. Sherry had a good life. Um, she never really got into any kind of trouble. She was a great mom. She was doing fantastic at her job. Everything was going great, but there is at least one person out there who did not want her to keep living. And somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth. Somebody has to know who did this to her. Because when a person kills someone, especially like that, they will tell someone. They'll let it slip. Maybe they got drunk one night or got high one night and told someone. It happens all the time. And perhaps that person that was told is you. You can report your information to police anonymously. You do not have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. If you have any information about the murder of Sherry Smith, please call 205-786-5217. Help Sherry and her children get the justice they all very rightfully deserve. 32 years ago, a man was found brutally murdered inside his San Diego apartment. And now all this time later, there has still been no arrests. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Todd Lauren. Viewer discretion is advised. 
Todd Lauren was born on January 14th, 1960, and that was in Detroit, Michigan. But by the time this case occurs, he's actually living in San Diego, California, my old stomping grounds. Todd and his father were really close. As a matter of fact, they would start a comic book business. It was called Revolutionary Comics. They would do unauthorized comic book biographies of well-known rock bands. Some of these musical artists were all on board with it. Some, not so much. Some actually ended up suing them. But Todd just kept on doing it. At the time of this case, Todd is 32 years old and he is also a gay man. And he was living in the Hillcrest neighborhood of San Diego, which I know growing up was considered kind of like the gay community. And he was living here in these apartments. On June 18th, 1992, Todd's dad would go to his apartment to check on him because he hadn't heard from him. When his dad walks inside of his apartment, he finds something horrific. His son was dead. Todd had been stabbed multiple times. And missing from the parking lot was Todd's vehicle. He owned a 1991 Chrysler LeBaron convertible. There were no witnesses, nobody saw anything, nobody heard anything. Police were getting very few tips, very few leads. And then sometime later, 500 miles away, his vehicle turns up. I guess it was parked in a parking lot, and there were fingerprints that they dusted for in the car. Those fingerprints came back to match this man here, Gary Lee Stewart. He actually openly admits that he was the one who was driving the car. He stole it. But he basically said he didn't know whose it was and that he had absolutely nothing to do with the murder of Todd Lauren. He would plead guilty with regards to the theft of the vehicle. He served a, a brief amount of time in jail, but was released. There has been no physical evidence, no witness statements, nothing that actually connects him directly to Todd's murder. And he has never been charged with the crime. The fact that Todd was also gay did kind of factor into some things like, could this have been a hate crime? Could he have met with the wrong person at a local bar? And this was also in the early 90s when the murders of gay people just, no one seemed to care. The investigations into the murders of like gay and lesbian people were sometimes, or a lot of the times, just shrugged off. Nobody cares, you know? Is that what happened in this particular case? I can't say for sure. Another thing that came up was the possibility that serial killer, spree killer, Andrew Kananen may have been responsible for Todd's death. Andrew, also being gay, um, had also been in San Diego, and the rumors are they, the two of them kind of circled around the same, you know, gay scene there in San Diego and may have crossed paths at some point. Now, no one has ever been able to corroborate that. The FBI even looked into a possible connection between him and Todd's murder, but they never said, have never have announced that he was responsible for it. It sounds like they have no evidence to actually say that he did it. And so sadly, here we are now, 32 years later, and Todd Lauren's murder is still unsolved. There is a very good chance that this was some kind of hate crime. There's also a chance maybe it's related to the comic books he sold. Maybe he pissed off the wrong person, the group. It's, it just isn't known. But somebody somewhere out there has got to know who murdered Todd Lauren. Killers love to talk. You can always report your information anonymously. You do not have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. So if you have any information about the murder of Todd Lauren, please call 619-531-2293. Just behind this door, 38 years ago, a horrific murder took place. And to this day, it is still unsolved. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Trisha Meredith. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Trisha Meredith was 19 years old. I know she had a younger brother and a sister, and she was dating a man named David Fain. In 1986, 19-year-old Trisha and her 21-year-old boyfriend David moved into the Spring Hill Apartments together. They had plans to get married, but they wanted to take small steps first. Trisha was a little uh, apprehensive at first about this situation because she was living next to people that she didn't know, you know, after spending her whole life at that point living at her family home. And she would call her mom on a daily basis, kind of just stating her fears about living next to strangers and her mom would say you know what that's okay it's just but it's a part of life you know everything's gonna be okay but unfortunately it was not going to be okay it was april 7th 1986 trisha and david were still trying to settle into their apartment they'd only moved in about a week prior and they were still trying to unpack and get things set up 
At approximately 6 p.m. that evening, they would take all of their laundry and they would go into the apartment complex's laundry room, which was just behind this door. And by the way, this case occurred in the state of Indiana. So David and Trisha, they get their laundry into the washing machine. And Trisha tells him, hey, don't worry, go back to the apartment. I'll sit here and wait for the wash to be done so I can move everything to the dryer, which would have been about a 25 minute time frame. At that point, David goes back to their apartment where he actually uh, calls his grandmother and they speak for quite some time. And as he's doing that, he's doing some kind of chores around the apartment. But after 30 or 40 minutes goes by, Trisha still hasn't gotten back to the apartment. And so he wondered what, what was going on. He goes back to the laundry room and he walks inside. At first, everything appears empty. But then, and this is a side-by-side -side of what it looked like then and now, he noticed a trail of blood leading to this corner, which at one point had like a storage closet. He opens the storage closet door and he finds one of the most horrific things a person could possibly find. He found his girlfriend, Trisha Meredith, in that closet covered in blood and she was deceased. He tried pulling her out to see if there was anything he could do, but it was definitely too late. It would later be determined that Trisha had been stabbed a staggering 24 times. She had her throat cut from end to end, and her stomach had been cut open. There was no evidence of a sexual assault, but police do believe that that was probably the person's motive. And police began to interview anyone and everyone that was in the vicinity. They interviewed everyone in the apartment complex, trying to see if there was anything they could gather. And what they did find out was that there were several people who actually heard very loud, terrified screams coming from the laundry room. The stories would vary. Some people said it was at 6.20 p.m., some said 6.30, some said 6.40. Now, they know that Trisha was alive for at least 25 minutes after David left because the laundry had been put into the dryer. So that would have been about 625 or so. Well, the witnesses said they heard these screams and one of the witnesses said they heard a scream that lasted at least 10 seconds. It was a very long blood curdling scream. And this person who heard it was with another person. I think they were playing tennis at their, the tennis court there. And they even cracked a joke. Oh, it sounds like someone's being murdered. Someone was, but all the people who heard this scream, none of them went to check on it. Not to say it would have done anything, but you never know. Within days of the murder uh, being reported, women around that same apartment complex begin to receive threatening phone calls. And it appears to be from a male caller who is saying that he was going to kill them just like he killed Trisha. He also told these women he was going to rape them. But then the calls just suddenly stopped. And somehow, some way, they were able to determine that this was not the killer. They, I believe, found out who it was, and then they were going to plan to arrest this guy for the harassment calls. But again, he was not the killer. They, of course, looked into the boyfriend, but they determined that he did not do this. The phone call he made to his grandmother was confirmed not only by the grandmother, but also by the phone records, the time frame, everything matched. And also just based on their relationship, how much they loved each other, there was no motive for him, and he was ruled out. There were two suspects in the case, though. One of the suspects was a man who was seen by several witnesses working on his car, literally just outside the laundry room. And according to police, while they were investigating this crime scene, this man was just constantly leaning on his, his patio and just kind of watching the police do their thing. They felt it was unusual, almost like he was trying to see what they were doing, how much they knew. They did find his DNA in the laundry room, but... It's not surprising because he lived there. He did his laundry in that laundry room all the time. And whatever leads they had on this guy, they never really got far with it. He's never been charged or arrested. The other suspect is a man named William Radiker. He also lived in the apartment complex. He tried to insert himself in the investigation. As a matter of fact, he let one of the officers into his apartment the day the body was found so that the officer could call the local precinct to report an update. Well, later they find out that William Radiker had a recording device on his phone and recorded that phone conversation between the officer and the police station. Then police get some information from William Radiker's employer that several days later, he was apparently talking about her murder and was almost saying like how he did it. And he became very aggressive towards other employees there. 
So they were actually granted a warrant to search his apartment. They took out some evidence like a hunting knife, um, I think a pair of sneakers. They had rubber gloves, I guess, they took from his apartment. And they asked him, will you do a polygraph test? And initially he said, yeah. But then almost right away he said, no. His DNA was also found in the laundry room, but the same thing with the first suspect. He lived there, he used laundry room all the time. That's not enough evidence. And the case has been cold ever since. The murder really affected um, her younger brother, Brandon, bad. His family would state that he never emotionally left that laundry room and he made it his life's mission to solve her case. But unfortunately, at the age of 38, Brandon died suddenly of a heart problem, never knowing who killed his sister. Their mother died as well, never finding out what happened. And now uh, her sister has a Facebook page dedicated to this case which is where I got all of these photos from, by the way. And they are still hoping against hope that someone somewhere out there knows the truth about what happened to Trisha Meredith that day. This was a horrific, brutal murder. 24 stab wounds, her throat slit, her stomach cut open. I mean, this was done by an absolute monster who has gotten away with it. But hopefully that monster is still alive out there so that he could face justice. If you have any information about the murder of Trisha Meredith, please call 317-327-3426. A couple is found dead inside of a bathtub, and unfortunately, there is just very little coverage of this story. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Tyrone and Chandrea. Viewer discretion is advised. This story occurred in the Mount Olive area of North Carolina, I guess a little outside of Raleigh. 27-year-old Tyrone T.J. Beeman Jr., he lived here in this house, and he was living there with his new girlfriend, 21-year-old Chandrea Milhouse. Tyrone had a three-year-old child from a previous relationship, and Chandrea had two children of her own from a previous relationship. On November 5th, 2013, Tyrone's mother would go to the house because she hadn't heard from him in a couple of days, and no one had heard from Chandrea either. When she enters the house, she sees three children there, Tyrone's child and Chandrea's two kids. They were unharmed. But when she begins to go through the house, she opens up the bathroom, and in the bathtub in that bathroom, she finds two bodies. Her son Tyrone and his girlfriend Chandrea were both found dead inside the tub. Tyrone had several blunt force trauma injuries to his body. He had also had been tied up. Both of them, the coroner would determine, were killed by strangulation. His hands were tied behind his back with a shoestring, and there was like a rolled up sheet found loosely tied around his neck. The police there said that this was definitely a very personal attack, and it was a vindictive attack. And unfortunately, the only witnesses to this crime was a three-year-old and a four-year-old. And there was also a nine-month-old baby. Police did talk to the three-year-olds, but obviously being three, it's not going to be easy to get good information. But the child did provide some information. He said stuff like, TJ was fighting, TJ fell, and TJ gone. But in terms of like a good description, I don't think they got that from the kids. The house itself, there was no forced entry, no kicked in doors, no cut windows, no broken windows. The house was not ransacked. Nothing appeared to have been stolen. This wasn't a, a drug-related crime. That whoever did this did it for a very personal reasons. Now, the couple had only been living in this house for a few months. And by the time they were found deceased, it's believed they were likely dead for at least a day, possibly two but answers have been far and few between. They have gotten tips, they've gotten some leads here and there, but there really isn't much published about this case, unfortunately. But as far as I can tell, this case is still very much unsolved. And somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth about who did this and why. If that person is you, if you have any information about the murders of Tyrone and Chandrea, there is a $3,000 reward for information that helps lead to the answers. But if you have information, please call 919-735-2255. Okay, so it took me a little while, but I finally was able to get to volume four of Unsolved Mysteries on Netflix. Um, it was five episodes long, this new volume. Can I ask real quick, Netflix, um, why did we need an episode, a full hour long episode on Jack the Ripper? And then why did we need another episode on the Mothman? 
Like, both of those are already very cemented into this particular genre. And both of those stories have been talked about and covered 65 kabillion times. That anyone who is into true crime and spooky stories, they already know those stories. Like, you, we, you couldn't find two more creepy unsolved murders or anything along those lines, missing persons, to do instead of those two episodes? I guess, I don't know. I guess me personally, I'm like, okay, another retelling of Jack the Ripper. Like, that. let's just be real. That's never going to be solved. We're never going to know the answer to that. And yeah, sure, it's ultimately probably one of the most well-known unsolved mysteries, but case in point as to why you didn't need to film a whole episode on it. Because we already know about it. And it ain't getting solved. You're, the show isn't going to help crack the case. That being said, the three middle episodes I did actually, I liked. There was a accidental, mysterious death. You know, a woman found the bottom of a staircase. Where have we seen that before, right? Initially ruled a homicide, but then later determines that it may have been an accident. But now it's ruled uh, undetermined. And if you've seen it already, how on earth could there be that much blood? That much blood and just smeared everywhere with fragments of a glass piggy bank in her hair. How is that even an accident? And then the second one, well, actually the third episode, technically, because Jack the Ripper is the first episode and then Mothman is the last one. But then there's uh, that one that involves a severed head being found in the middle of the woods by this teenager. And to this day, nobody knows who the head belongs to. They've never identified her because the head was already embalmed. So they don't know if she was a murder victim who was embalmed or if this was like a uh, black market selling body parts kind of thing. It's kind of an unsettling story, really. And then the third one was about the uh, murder of a young student, Sigrid Stevenson, I believe. Uh, she was found brutally murdered on a, a stage in a locked building. And that was a case, those three cases that I just listed, I had never heard of before. So that, you know, that's great. Brought awareness to those stories. That's amazing. I've already added them to my list and one day I'll cover them. But we didn't need Jack the Ripper. <laughs> we didn't need Mothman again. Surely you could find other stories. Maybe you disagree with me. Ha Santa's taint. I think this is the guy. This is the, this is, he's the one eating all the cats and dogs. Oh. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Warren Leslie Forrest. Viewer discretion is advised. On July 11th, 1974, 20-year-old Krista Blake was last seen getting into a blue Ford van. Krista was someone who was known to hitchhike. Hitchhiking was obviously a lot more common back then. But after witnesses saw her getting into this blue van, she was never seen again. And then, two years later, in 1976, skeletal remains were found in a wooded area. And it was evident that this victim had been bound before she was dumped there because they, she still had the bindings on. And I guess they were able to determine that this victim had been strangled to death. Now, eventually, the remains would be identified as 20-year-old Krista Blake. And by the way, she was found in Tooks Mountain on, in Washington State. But now rewinding back to 1974... A 20-year-old woman, also from Washington State, well, she would go to police and tell them that she had just been abducted by a man in a blue van. She would recount to police how she was tied up and bound like this, and this man shot darts into her, which I guess he thought that would kill her, but obviously it didn't. She manages to get away and go to police, and the description she gave matched this man here, Warren Leslie Forrest, who just so happened to be known as someone who drove a 1972-1973 blue Ford van, which conveniently he no longer had. Warren had a pretty normal upbringing. He did good in school. He went to college. He fought in the Vietnam War. In 1969, he marries his wife and they have two kids together. And by all accounts, they had a pretty normal marriage. She said he was never violent towards her. And they bounced around kind of from state to state, but eventually they found themselves in Battleground, Washington. So based on the very detailed description of the man, who again was him, they were able to obtain a warrant to search his home. And in his home, they found dart guns, which matched the exact description the victim gave. 
Now, when asked by police with regards to Krista Blake, because they remembered that she was last seen getting into a blue van. Well, the witnesses, they would re-interview them and determine that the guy driving the van was pretty much this guy. Now, at that point, they actually hadn't found her body yet. So he's questioned about it, and he, of course, denies it. Once they find her body two years later, they re-interview him on this. Now, his wife would say that they were on vacation in Long Beach, Washington on the day, on that day that Krista Blake was eventually kidnapped. But then his mother would say that, well, he was sort of there, but then he was gone for a long period of time. And so he was basically gone for almost 24 hours. He didn't come back to where they were until the following day, which would have then given him plenty of time to kidnap Krista Blake and kill her. And so based on the eyewitness testimony of the man seen driving the van that both Krista Blake got into and that this surviving witness got into, he was arrested and charged with Krista Blake's murder, and he would be convicted of that crime. But Krista was not the only victim. In September of 1974, a 17-year-old girl named Martha Morrison went missing. She disappeared from Portland, Oregon. A month later, her body was found in Dole Valley. But at that point, there was no forensic evidence linking her to really anyone. But then decades later, there are retesting evidence that they had with her and one of those dart guns that was found in Warren's home, well, it actually had traces of blood on it. And so decades later, they test that blood and it comes back with a match to Martha Morrison's blood which then linked Warren Leslie Forrest directly to her murder. So the Crypt Keeper's great-great-grandfather, Warren Leslie Forrest, was, went on trial in 2019 for her murder. He would be convicted of that one and sentenced to life in prison, just like he was with Krista Blake. So he got two full life sentences. But that may not have been the only two victims. Warren Leslie Forrest is believed to have been responsible for many more including 16-year-old Jamie Grissom. Her body has never been found. 18-year-old Barbara Derry. Her body was found. 14-year-old Diane Gilchrist. Her body has never been found. 19-year-old Gloria Knutson. Her body was found. And then 20-year-old Carol Valenzuela. Her body was found in close proximity to the area where Martha Morrison's body was found. Now, all of their disappearances slash potential murders were between 1971 and 1974, all in the same area that the other two, for sure, murders happened in. However, no forensic evidence has linked Warren Forrest to any of their disappearances or murders. But all were known to potentially be hitchhikers, which was kind of his thing, his M.O., he would pick up hitchhikers. Will those women ever get justice? I can't say. Here in 2024, he is 75 years old. He will never be out of prison. But it would be nice that if those other families could get justice, there is still plenty of time to do that. Two friends just wanted to hang out after work, but unfortunately it would lead to their brutal murders. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Wendy Alfredo and Don McCreary. Viewer discretion is advised. It was 1986 in Akron, Ohio. Wendy and Don were very good friends. They both were attending the University of Akron, and they were working together at a local diner. Both of them would be described by their friends and family as being kind-hearted people. They were full of life, and they, they were just good people. They never would dream of causing harm to anyone, but unfortunately, harm would come to them together. It was September 1st, 1986, along Interstate 77 in Akron, Ohio. 20-year-old Don and 21-year-old Wendy had just gotten off of their waitress shifts, and they were driving down this road, when just by sheer coincidence, there were three teenage boys who were on an overpass along the interstate. They were throwing rocks and boulders off of the overpass, and one of those rocks smashed into the car that Wendy and Don were in which caused them to drive off the road. These teenage boys in this pretend act of playing the hero would say, hey, we'll drive you to the nearby mall so you can give you know, someone a call to give you guys some help. And that's, that does happen. These teenage boys were 19-year-old Richard Cooey and 17-year-old Clinton Dickens. The third friend who had been participating in these throwing of rocks, his name was Kenneth. 
So Wendy is the one on the payphone. And at one point, she even has her mom talk to one of the boys. And it sounds like the plan was the boys to help, you know, bring them home. But that never happened. It was the very next day. And some hikers were walking along this path when they noticed some something sticking out of some bushes. When they got closer, they realized that it was the bodies of two different females. The teenage girls had been reported missing the night before when they never arrived home. And when these bodies were found with the missing persons report, they would confirm that the bodies found were that of Wendy and Dawn. Dawn had been stabbed in her neck and Wendy had been strangled to death. Both bodies had several bruises and both girls had been raped. The mother would tell police, you know, I, I spoke to one of these boys, but it, it didn't unfortunately help identify them. There really wasn't much evidence at the crime scene that would help identify them either. However, they did find out that the girls were missing jewelry. And so police were like, okay, there's a pretty good chance that they're probably going to try to sell this jewelry. Lo and behold, that actually happens. Police were informed that a young man named Richard Cooey had been trying to sell an item of jewelry that matched the jewelry that was missing from the girls. They also found out that Richard Cooey had been bragging about killing and raping these girls. Now, there was biological evidence found with the two girls in the form of DNA. DNA testing was still very much in his infancy back then. They could do blood typing. Once they had him as a suspect, he had to provide his DNA, and it was the same blood type. Through him, they discovered uh, his accomplice, Clinton Dickens. DNA found at the crime scene also matched the same blood type as him. The third friend they were able to confirm had left the entire scenario before the two girls were even kidnapped. He had nothing to do with what happened to them. Since Richard Cooey was 19 years old at the time, he was eligible to receive the death penalty. The DNA evidence, the stolen jewelry being sold by him, the mother hearing his voice, and also the friends who said he had been talking about killing the girls was all more than enough. He was convicted of both murders and kidnapping and rape, and he was sentenced to death. Clinton Dickens was only 17 years old at the time these murders happened. From what it sounds like, he was more of the instigator of this entire thing. However, because he was under the age of 18, he was not eligible for the death penalty. Despite being less than six months away from being an adult who would qualify for the death penalty. He was also convicted based on pretty much the same evidence, and he was sentenced to 95 years in prison. But then there was the Senate Bill 256 introduced, which stated that anyone who was a teenager convicted of a crime had to be eligible for parole. So his sentence was technically reduced where he could be eligible for parole, I believe, after 30 years. As recently that I can see as a 2023 or maybe even 2024, he had tried to get parole, but he has been denied and he is still in a prison cell. Holy shit. This is Richard Cooey. I shit you not. This man tried to appeal his death sentence. He said, and this is what they tried to present, he was now too fat to be executed. What? Is that even a thing? Fucking hell, he is horrifying. It's like a fucking scary pool ball with a beard. Anyway, his appeal was denied. Turns out, I guess it's not inhumane to execute the, what he said is the morbidly obese. In 2008, Richard Cooey was executed. And Wendy and Dawn got the justice they rightfully deserved. He was on a road trip to visit family, but he never made it. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Woodrow Grimland. Viewer discretion is advised. In May of 1990, Woodrow would leave his home in Needles, California by vehicle, and he was going to drive all the way to Plainview, Texas to visit family. The 72-year-old man would get to Flagstaff, Arizona, which is in northern Arizona, to visit his son. Woodrow got there without any issues. They had a great time. And on May 9th, 1990, Woodrow left their home in Flagstaff. His plan was to be in Plainview, Texas the following afternoon. But Woodrow never made it. As a matter of fact, none of his family would ever see or hear from him ever again. So after he never arrived, his family in Texas would contact his family in Needles, California. And so his family in Needles would report him missing there. And from the get-go, the search for him was... it was difficult. 
because this was back in 1990. Cameras weren't everywhere yet, and there's no crime scene or anything. And he's traveling by car across multiple states. He could literally be anywhere. When they do get his information out, though, they do get some tips from, I think, three different people in New Mexico. These three people said they saw Woodrow Grimland at a truck stop there. This was in a Klein's Corners area of New Mexico. The multiple witnesses who saw him there said he seemed like he was in perfectly good spirits. Everything seemed normal. And these witnesses, by the way, were employees of the truck stop. So his son Ronald in Flagstaff would get into his car with his wife and they would take the same path that Woodrow would have taken just to see if they can find anything like his vehicle, which was a pickup truck. But they never, they never found him. They've never found his remains. They've never found his truck. There has been no other sightings of him. The last time anyone saw him was at that truck stop, and that's it. Could he have met with foul play at the truck stop? Maybe. Could he have met with foul play on the road to Texas? Maybe. But unfortunately, nobody knows what happened. And with it being such a massive search area, it's been impossible for police to really do anything. They're really relying just on people coming forward. But it's been decades now, and still nobody has seen him. And nobody has come forward. No tips. Nothing. No leads. He just vanished. But somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth about where he is or what happened to him. I don't really know much about his personal life, like if he was depressed or anything like that. I don't know. But it does sound like that this was not something he would have done on his own. But you also can't say for sure that he met with foul play. Maybe there was an accident somewhere. But you think that would have been reported at some point. But if you have any information about the whereabouts or what happened to Woodrow Grimland, please contact the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department at 760-326-9200.